Call the meeting of the City Council Finance uh, Committee to order for Tuesday evening, April 21st, 2015, <laughs> approximately about 7.04 p.m. I will also make mention that we're having a little problem again this evening with uh, cable. I understand the way that the feed is coming in. We could be, hate to say it, we could be bouncing on the TV screen a little bit at home and not <coughs> being clear um, to, our, uh, to our viewers. So in any case, um, again, as, they, as the situation was a few weeks ago, once they um, tape us and you have the uh, repeat of the meetings, that's usually pretty much uh, clearer. So uh, apologize to the viewers and even apologize for um, you people that are here this evening that are gonna be saying some words as well. Just a couple of uh, things before we begin. Just a few people that were listed to be here this evening that unfortunately are not going to be here this evening. Our DPW Commissioner, Mr. Larry Raleigh, has been on vacation, but it's returning very late this evening, um, so he's unable to attend uh, the meeting this evening. Uh, city Planner, Mr. Robert May, I had contact, uh, co I had talked to him today as well, and he's attending a conference. It's a planning association conference, so he's away for the next few days as well. Uh, Fire Chief uh, Francis is unable to attend, but our Deputy Chief uh, uh, Galligan is filling in for him. And Mr. Moises uh, Parente, um, well, I guess you know what the issue is there. He's unable to attend again, so unfortunately um, uh, he will not be here. So those are the list of the people that are not uh, present uh, this evening. Councilor Cruz, did you want to? Mr. Chairman, if I might, uh, I, I brought forward to the Council Resolve. It's number 14. I'd like to make a motion that we hear that one first. It's an Second. update Second. on the Council on Aging. Motion's been made and second that we take uh, number 14 resolved. That's for the director of the council on aging. All in favor? Opposed? That being said, Madam Clerk, would you read item number 14? <coughs> resolved that the director of the council on aging be invited to appear before a committee of the council to provide an update relative to the Brockton Council on Aging and the aging population in the city of Brockton. <coughs> invited Janice Fitzgerald, director of council on aging, Dorothy Slack, outreach coordinator, Lorraine Lally, chairman of the Friends of the Brockton Council on Aging. Good evening. Good evening. I just oh, yeah. have some um, forms to pass out. Yes, you may. <clears throat> they got a little cold on. Hmm? Thank you. Cold. No, I. Yeah, there should be. So. I can't kill you. Thank you uh, very much for the invitation to be here tonight to talk about the Council on Aging. Um, joining me this evening, I have my outreach coordinator, Dorothy Slack, and unfortunately, Lorraine Lally, uh, chairwoman of the board, was unable to attend this evening. So this evening, I would like to talk about the elder population in the community, the role of the COA, what services we provide, data from 2014, our ac accomplishments in the direction of the COA, in something very exciting. Based on figures from the 2010 census, Brockton has 15,883 people aged 60 or older. The Massachusetts Healthy Aging Community data profile states that 60% of the elder population in Brockton is living with four or more chronic conditions. Our elder population exceeds the state estimate in all chronic disease categories. In addition, most of our elders are living on a very low fixed income. Every day they are faced with making choices for medication, food, and living expenses. At times, they choose to not take life-sustaining <coughs> medication to be able to pay for their utility bills or food. Luckily for them, we are here to help. Through the years, our role in the community has changed significantly. The days of us being known only as a great party place <laughs> needs to change. Please, if I hear that one more time. The COA has become a community designated focal point for social and support services to our over 15,883 seniors their families, and their caregivers. We serve as the gateway to the nation's aging network connecting adults and other agencies to vital community services that can help elders stay healthy, independent, and at home. The Administration on Aging defines a focal point as a facility established to encourage maximum coordination 
in collaboration of services for older persons. We are the first stop on the elder care continuum. We do not place elders on a waiting list. Income does not have any bearing on their ability to access our services. And we are and will continue to be a welcoming place to all. So let me tell you about some of the services we provide. And then I will have Dottie talk about some of the specific situations that she encounters daily. We advocate for our seniors, whether it be for housing, elder abuse, scams, Medicare, mass health, and social security issues. We provide information and referrals. We do fuel and food stamp applications. We offer options counseling. We discuss housing options and review their applications. We assist with evictions, foreclosures, and homelessness. We also help elders that are getting close to having utilities shut off. We work and advocate on their behalf. Also, now that I have outreach staff, we're able to visit homebound elders to make sure they're getting the services that they need to stay home. <clears throat> this year, we were able to do snow removal for 100 elders and disabled individuals. We did that with the help of Stonehill College football team and their coaches. Once a week, they would show up with shovels, hungry bellies, because we fed them after mm -hmm. they went out, and they took care of 100 homes that needed to get shoveled out. We are the go-to place for other agencies that deal with the elder population. Or, you know what? Sometimes we're just a pair of caring ears that sits and listen to, listens to an elder who may have lost a loved one. Mm or may have some mental health issues. So briefly, um, a couple of situations that stuck out in my mind this last year of people we were able to help. We had a married couple, 80 years old. The husband was deaf, he had Alzheimer's disease. His wife was the caretaker because she didn't want to put him in a nursing home. In the middle of November, their furnace died. They couldn't find any funds. Self-help wasn't able to help them at the time. Um, so I intervened, did what I could, found them some emergency housing um, because we had to place them somewhere for the time their furnace wasn't working until we could resolve the situation. Luckily, we were. Self-help stepped up to the plate. They um, put in a new furnace. And we were able to also get that couple food stamps um, fuel assistance, and we even got the husband free hearing aids. Another situation I remember very clearly is we would have this lady come in every single day. She didn't say much. She'd say, hi, how are you? I'm going to get a cup of coffee. And off she would go. And she would stay for hours. And she wouldn't have much conversation. One day she came up to me and said, I need to tell you something. I'm in an abusive situation with my daughter. I come here because it's a safe place. So we made the referral. We did what we had to do to get her help. Now she comes in with a big smile on her face, ready to engage in activities and conversation. And the last story that sticks out in my mind is a gentleman who was in his 80s. He um, had very poor health. <coughs> and he didn't have much money. He came to me and asked me if I could help him get food for his dog. I said, food for your dog? Yeah, that's easy. Made a phone call, I got some vouchers. We got some dog food for his, his only companion. Come to find out, the food wasn't just for his dog. He was eating the food also. So those are some stories you need to hear. Um, and Dottie has some more. Thank you for allowing me to speak before all of you this evening. Uh, my name is Dottie Slack. I want to just give you a little bit of my background and how I came to be the outreach coordinator at the Brockton Council on Aging. I have been a registered nurse for 52 years. The last 35 years have been in the field of geriatrics. 
Um, I was the Shine Counselor volunteering at the Brockton Council on Aging for the last six years. And as I got to the point where I thought I would like to um, not be working full time, but, but stay in the area of um, working with the elderly, um, Janice approached me about outreach. But not only outreach, but health education. Uh, health education is very, very important to our seniors. And as Janice said, many of them have at least four chronic disease, some many, many more. And so we do have chronic disease self-management programs at the Council on Aging. We have diabetes self-management workshops. <coughs> we have monthly programs where we, we look at things that are bothering um, our seniors um, on, uh, you know, such as prostate cancer, urinary tract infections, um, arthritis, um, what, how, what are all these superbugs about? What, what do we know about MRSA? What do we know about C. difficile? So our goal is not only, we, we, we're reaching these seniors, but to have Brockton become a healthy aging community. <clears throat> As we have now almost 16,000 um, seniors, the fastest growing population is the over 60 age group. And our baby boomers, they want more, they want more than bingo, they want more, you know, they want Zumba, they want aerobics, they want to stay healthy, they want to walk, they want to swim, they want to do things. And so we're, we're there to help them to be able to do these things. But probably the most important thing we do on a, on a daily basis is to be there for the people that come in. And as Janice was talking about the different people who come in, it brings me to one day one of the gentlemen who comes in almost every day He's a 70 year old gentleman, asked to speak to the two of us. This is a gentleman who doesn't say too much. And he came in and he sat down and he told us both that he had a, had a stroke the week before. Uh, and he had been at, um, at one of our local hospitals and that he um, had, his carotid artery was completely blocked off. His problem, he had never signed up for Medicare. He had no insurance at all. He was 70 years old, he was out of the general enrollment, so even though we sent him to sign up for Medicare, he wasn't <clears> going to become eligible until July 1st of this year. He had no insurance at all. And so we, we got together, we got on the phone, and we collaborated. We collaborated with the hospital, with the doctor, with the, with the nurses, with the anesthesia, with everyone. And he had a carotid artery, and a, carotid artery endarterectomy. Now you're gonna to have to spell that when I'm finished, so. Um, and it was all done, no insurance was involved, and there was a collaboration between us and other members of the community of Brockton. And this gentleman was admitted, he had his surgery, he was <coughs> home within 48 hours, and he was back visiting with us every day, and he every day tells me I have a new lease on life, and I am enjoying this new lease on life. And you can see the change in him. He reaches out more to the other seniors that are at, the, at our center. <coughs> um, and so because of, of this, you know, he, he will tell someone, and the next thing you know, we've got somebody coming in, sitting down and saying, I've got this problem, I've got that problem. Another woman came in, she had retired from Brigham and Women's Hospital, lived in Brockton, Worked there as a certified nurse's aide, took the MBTA from Brockton to Boston every day. Retired, she was, she's 72 years old, retired last December, December 14th. Her Medicare should have started December 1st. There was a misunderstanding at the Social Security office and they didn't start her until January 1st. But in the meantime, on December 18th, she had some major issues and ended up with an $8,000 hospital bill. So I was able to get on the phone, call Medicare, rectify the issue so that she did not have to pay that $8,000. So these are the things that we do. These are the things we do on a daily basis. So far this year in outreach, we've seen about 565 people. Not too bad because I'm only there three days a week. And um, we, we want to continue doing this. We want Brockton to be a healthy aging community. And um, we have a plan for that, don't we? We do. Okay, because we, we, we're, we're outgrowing everything. Every time I have 
I have a health education thing. It's where are we going to have this? Where are we going to put these people? Where can we set up a classroom? Um, and now we're getting a following. We've got more and more people coming to all these classes because our, our seniors want to learn. They, they, they want to be an educated group. Thank you, Dottie. So you see, we're more than just that great party place. We do, we do a lot more than just have parties. So that does bring me to the, um, the boards here to my right, you're in front of you. Um, we are planning and hoping to be able to add on to the COA. The Friends of the Council on Aging will be starting a camp capital campaign shortly to raise um, about $500,000. We are short-staffed and we are busting at the seams. Our data from FY 2014 states that we delivered 4,500 newsletters. We welcomed over 400 new members. We average about 100 visits a day. We provide outreach services to 2,500 individuals in a year. We served over 758 congregate meals. And you ready for this one? We answered 14,400 phone calls <coughs> in a year. That explains why we are so tired. So these are great accomplishments. I am so proud of what we've accomplished. I'm proud of my staff, Dottie, Lynn, and Michelle, and I'm extremely proud of my volunteers that step up time and time again to help us out. So this is our future. I feel good about the future. Our numbers are growing and they're only going to continue to grow as the baby boomers um, become older. We're living longer. That's a good thing. Um, so we need the room to be able to provide what we've been providing um, without the addition. So I thank you all very much for listening to my long-winded story, but um, I like to make sure you hear it every single year. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Councilor Barnes. Yes, uh, Ms. Fitzgerald. Who is the new SHINE coordinator, just so that people are clear if they have some information with regard to uh, <coughs> Medicare? So I have two SHINE counselors. I okay. have Dottie Slack, okay. who's with me three days a week, and I now have um, a Shine counselor from Old Colony Elder Services who will be with me um, Wednesdays all day. Okay. But Wednesdays. people can, I'm also a Shine counselor, so people can call anytime. And if someone isn't there to meet with them, I can certainly help them. <coughs> okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, uh, counselor. Counselors? Motion for a favorable second. recommendation second. of a full council. It's been made and seconded. Do we send it back to the full city council? All in favor? Opposed? Goes back to the full city council. Thank a favorable you. recommendation. Thank you, Director. Thank Appreciate you, Jan. all that you you do and everyone does there as well. Thank you. Madam Clerk, we go to item number one. Order that the city council rescind order 76 as adopted by the council on March 9th, 2015 for the purpose of accepting and expending 339,040-R Smart Growth Incentive Dividend for various planning purposes, accordingly requesting that the City Council establish a revolving fund for the intended purpose in accordance with the Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 53, E and a half. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Heidi Chakran, Auditor, Robert May, Director of Planning. Councilors, if you can recall, we postponed this, I believe, at our last meeting because we had some concerns and questions in regards to the 40R and uh, I guess especially for um, its development <coughs> some years back and, and concern with some of the uh, finances then. But in any case, um, Mr. Condon is here tonight to speak on behalf of that. Uh, I did speak with uh, um, Ms. Chuckwin a few weeks ago when I had a meeting with her and uh, she was going to be here but because of scheduling she just couldn't be this evening. So again, Mr. Condon's going to uh, bring us up to speed on this. I think this is very important that both one and two tie in together and I think we need to make sure that we get this back to the full city council um, because this account does need to, this revolving fund does need to be established. But in any case, Mr. Condon, in regards to your presentation, any questions? Okay. Well, there are a couple of uh, things we're trying to address here. The, the first you. is that the uh, city received this uh, 40R money last fall. Uh, it came in uh, subsequent to our having set the uh, tax rate. 
So we attempted to make an appropriation to uh, the, the planning department so that it could be used for economic development purposes. However, the Department of Revenue has a ruling that 40R funds are not special revenues in and of themselves. They're supposed to go to the general fund and be appropriated. And because the tax rate had been set, we couldn't make an appropriation uh, to the st uh, intended purpose. So the order that was passed by City Council won't stand uh, by the Department of Revenue when we go to set the next tax rate. So we need to rescind it to clear the decks on that. The second order uh, explains what we intend to do instead. I know that's not for you right now. And the second thing you were looking for was an explanation of what had happened to prior 40R receipts that had come in uh, back toward the end of the Harrington administration and the beginning the Balzotti administration. I think I've sent, probably all of you have received it, an email which explained that most of that money was dedicated during the Balzotti administration to the Brockton Redevelopment Authority for qualified project purposes. All except, I think, about $11,000 of that had been spent. The 11000 closed as it's supposed to to free cash when those years were closed out. And a second uh, receipt uh, was uh, not known by the city when it was coming in, and that also closed out the free cash. We didn't, we didn't appropriate it at the time. When that was going on, we didn't have a planning director or planning department really to oversee it. And so I'll delay the other part until item two comes okay. before you. Council, is there any question pertaining to item number one that's uh, before us? Make a favorable recommendation back to full council. Second. Second. Motion's been made and second that it goes back to the full city council. All in favor? All opposed, that goes back to the full City Council with a favorable recommendation. It's item number two, Madam Clerk, if you'd read that, please. Order that pursuant to the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, the City Council authorizes the establishment of a 40-hour smart grant incentive revolving fund for said receipts from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for purposes <coughs> of engaging in professional consulting services to prepare a citywide comprehensive plan, downtown redevelopment plan, Downtown District Improvement Plan, Campello District Redevelopment Plan, and to help fund the management by the Brockton Redevelopment Authority of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Home Program. <coughs> Expenditure from the revolving fund shall be under the direction of the Department of Planning and Economic Development and shall be limited to 350000 in fiscal year 15. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, and Chief Financial Officer, Heidi Chakra, an auditor, and Robert May, director of planning. And again, counselors, this is the one I believe there were some questions and concerns in how the other uh, 40 hour money w was spent. I think uh, Mr. Condon did touch base on <coughs> one most important issue is that if we were not to do something with this, then it all of a sudden becomes part of free cash and we can't allow that to happen. So in any case, Mr. Condon, your explanation on this. Okay, so basically this is intended to correct the problem that we're facing, that this 40-hour money isn't a special revenue uh, by state law, it's different. Uh, there was some confusion about that. We weren't the only community that didn't understand that and the Department of Revenue had to make a ruling for a number of communities. But in any case, if we establish a revolving fund, it allows the city council to restrict the purposes for which it can be spent. It doesn't get spent without with additional appropriation. This allows the expenditure of it. It has to be renewed every year. At the end of every fiscal year, when you renew it, you get to see what we've spent it on in the year before, and you renew it with respect to the amount of money that you're allowed to be spent and the restrictions placed on it. So by establishing this fund and then continuing to renew it as we have additional 40-hour projects, we can spend the money in a manner that allows uh, the stated purpose to be accomplished without the fear that by not picking up it goes to free cash. If we renew it, whatever balance is in the fund at the end of the fiscal year rolls forward to the next fiscal year and can be spent by City Council's direction. Thank you, Mr. Coney. Councilors. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Cruz. I, I think you answered most of what I, uh, so the, the, in the order, this money can only spend spe be spent specifically on what's in the order, correct? Correct. And uh, because the only thing, I mean, you don't, we don't want to lose too much control. And so this money going forward would only be 40 hour money is all we would be putting into this fund. Correct. And we, we get to look at those uh, revolving funds every year. Yes. Make that decision. And we won't know whether, what kind of dollar amounts would be coming in each year, correct? No, we don't know. I mean, there have been years we received nothing. Nothing. 
so this by renewing it every year, even if it's only for a couple of dollars, and I would suggest we probably want to renew it for a substantial amount for a while because I think we have 40-hour projects that will probably qualify for additional funding. But by doing that every year in the June time period, the City Council will get the request for the renewal of the fund. You'll see what it was spent for in the prior year, and you get to make your decision. And we don't have this problem of it closes out to free cash and doesn't go to the purpose it was expected to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Chairman. Council. Any other council? Council Sullivan. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Connor, thank you very much for the, uh, the due diligence you did. Yes. I, mean, it was, I know you and Ms. Chakra and Mr. May yes. spent a lot of time on that, and I think it helped us uh, get, kind of get our arms around it. So thank you for that. I think a revolving fund will much more uh, clarify the situation going forward. Yep. The only question I had, and again, I'm not trying to finger point, but the way that it's re it reads is that the planning department has full discretion to utilize and expand up to 350000 was there any thought giving, again, that's a department head, but was there any thought that it could be under the direction of the planner, but approval of either the mayor or you? Um, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty open-ended there. It, it, it is. He had a specific set of plans that he was looking to spend it on. Um, I, I don't think it's appropriate for, for me to be involved in that. I think okay. I should be off to the side. The planner reports to the mayor in any case, so the mayor can uh, execute whatever authority he wants over the over the, the, the way the guy conducts his daily activities. And I think um, with respect to the council, he's confirmed in his appointment, I think, by, by the city council. So you've got some oversight, not at the moment, but at the end of every fiscal year when you see how it was spent and if you don't like it. But he did have plans. I think, um, I don't recall them off the top of my head, but there were specific elements in which he was, to which he was going to dedicate that 350000 Most of it, I thought, was for downtown planning and economic development, as I recall. A little bit for Campello, Campello. and a little bit for Montello, I think. And the, and the school as well, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Council, any other <clears throat> questions? Concerns. Motion recommend favorably. Second. second. Motion's been made and second that it goes back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed. Goes back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you, council. Thank That's you, a good Cohen. outcome. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. it. Item number three, Madam Clerk. Order appropriation of three thousand five hundred from the National Association of County and City Health Officials Dang. Department of Health and Human Services Grant Fund to the City of Brockton Board of Health. These grant monies are for the purpose of building the level of volunteers for the local medical reserve corps. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, and Louis Tataglia, Executive Director of Health. Good evening, Mr. Tataglia. Good evening, Councilors. <coughs> uh, this is a straightforward grant. There's no matching uh, funds for this. Um, it's a grant we get every year from uh, Nacho. Any, any questions? Motion to recommend favor. Second. 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 Motion to be made and seconded and to recommend uh, to the full city council. All in favor? The polls goes back to the full city council with favor of recommendation. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Council. Item number four, Madam Clerk. Order appropriation of 3000 from the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency grant to the Brockton Emergency Management Agency grant fund. The Brockton Emergency Management Agency, BEMA, intends to use these grant funds to purchase a Panasonic tough pad computer. No match is required. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, and Stephen Hook, Jr., Director of BEMA. Good evening, Mr. Hook. How are you? Good evening, Councilors. Uh, this is just a straightforward grant from the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. Uh, no match required. Motion to recommend. Second. Motion was made and seconded to recommend to the full City Council. All in favor? Opposed goes back to the full City Council. Favorable recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Hook. Item number five, Madam Clerk. Order appropriation of $1,015,440 from the available funds, Brockton's Chapter 90 apportionment for the fiscal year 2015 to the Highway Transportation Project Fund's fiscal year 15 Chapter 90 projects to provide additional funding for the purpose of the design and construction costs necessary for approved projects. This request is based on an increase in the Chapter 90 apportionment for fiscal year 15 from $2,030,878 to $3,046,318. Further requesting that the order and authorization designate the DPW Commissioner to carry out the work to be performed <coughs> under the conditions of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Standard Contract Form. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner. We've come so far these last few months, huh, Mr. Condon? This, the grass is green and the flowers are blooming, and look what this caused us, right? Snow. We'll snow, cost exactly. Us, right? Ho exactly. Hopefully we're done with the snow for a while, although back in uh, Bridgewater, the last bit of snow in my driveway just melted the day before <laughs> Patriot's Day. <laughs> it was uh, a bad winter. So. But this is not the pothole money. I wanted to make clear to you uh, folks that this is uh, an increase in the regular Chapter 90 apportionment. The pothole money, we didn't receive the contract form from the state in time to get it in front of you last Monday night. 
So we're going to bring it in for the next council meeting and hope that perhaps you'll pass it under suspension of the rules. That's about $300,000 and we've got a time frame on that. But this is just regular chapter 90 money. Mr. President. Councilor DeWa. Um, I, as, a, as a new state representative, uh, I was on the floor and really worked to get an increase in Chapter 90 funding and, and took the vote to make this appropriation. So I hope that um, in you know the due course, I also get to vote to accept it as a city councilor because I know how important road and infrastructure repair is. Do you know what roads we're actually going to be doing with this money? I, I don't, Councillor, or perhaps the, the mayor here? does. Or? No, he's no. no, the commissioner is not here this evening. So, so. Um, could the mayor? That would be great. <clears throat> Council, the specific list for this year is not finalized yet. I believe that the commissioner has received requests from some, but not all of the councillors yet. I've never been asked for for 2015 or. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Riley obviously is not here, but he did send correspondence out a little while ago. I'll let you know. I put the same streets on every single year, but okay. I haven't been asked yet. So I, I just want. I you can to help know. you with a little Thank of this. Thank you. Um, his plan is to use so. As you referenced, we're getting a little more money this year than we did last year, uh, about a million dollars. His plan is to use about half of this, along with the 300,000 of pothole funds, for emergency repairs for some really critical situations on a number of streets uh, around the city. And uh, all of those, uh, those areas have been identified. Uh, the other half, roughly half a million dollars, would be included with the two million of uh, previously appropriated chapter 90 money so instead of having two million to do streets with this year it's about two excuse me <clears throat> about 2.5 rather than the two uh, as far as the correspondence between uh, the commissioner and the and the counselors i'm not directly involved in that but he has not finalized his list so i'm sure he has time to uh, still get some input from you. Well, I think that um, he probably is watching it, but if he's not, if someone here, if they speak to him, if you could just tell him that I want the same exact streets as I did last year because none of my streets, not one Ward 6 street got done this yep. year. We did First vote. time ever in my 10 years as a city councilor that not one Ward 6 street was done. And you live in that district, so I'm just sad yeah. about that. But I appreciate your hard work. We're going to do the best Thank we can with much. the limited funds that we have available, Councilor. And people in Brookfield pay taxes too. Council, right? I'll, make, I'll, make, I'll make sure that the uh, I'll make sure that the commissioner is <clears throat> well aware of your concern with your streets up there as well. Okay. Yep. Any other motion questions? Motion recommend favorably. Uh, on the motion. On the motion, Council. Sorry, Bounds. yes, um, Mr. Condon. I'm not sure if I should ask you or the mayor. It sounded to me really quickly that you all said something that um, that it was a little contradictory. You said that this money was not the designated pothole money. That that money would be coming later. And that's right. Okay. So when the mayor got up he did mention that half of this would go to the pothole so is it it's in addition to what the, what the mayor said was of this million dollars okay isn't the commissioner's intention is to pull five hundred thousand dollars okay and combine it with the pothole money to create I'm a bigger fund for taking care of the most critical needs okay just making sure it's added to the earlier apportionment of chapter 90. okay i just want to make sure it wasn't like restricted right. to just that or that but that it can be spread around okay thank you thank you sir second council cruz's motion Motion's been made and seconded to send back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? Goes back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. Uh, item number six, Madam Clerk. Order appropriation of 12000 from the Massachusetts Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, EOPS Highway Safety Division, Fiscal Year 2015 Traffic Enforcement Grant to the City of Brockton Police <coughs> Department, EOPS Fiscal Year 15 Traffic Enforcement Grant Fund. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John <coughs> Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Robert DeBarry, Captain Traffic Commission. Good evening, Captain DeBerry. How are you? Good. Any, this is a grant we get every year. It's twelve thousand dollars for um, three different mobilizations throughout the course uh, from now through uh, September fourth. Give a recommendation. Re second. Motion for made and seconded. Send back to the full city council. All in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Goes back to the full city council. Favor <coughs> recommendation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Captain. Madam Clerk, number seven. Order a transfer of 15000 from the Fire Department Ambulance Receipts to the Fire Department Purchase of Services to be used for the payment to perform software support for the period of July 1, 2015 to June 30, 2016. This provides for support services to the computer-aided dispatching CAD program currently in use at the fire at Fire Alarm. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Richard Francis, Chief of Fire. 
And as I indicated, the uh, uh, fire chief could not be here this evening. The deputy uh, chief Galligan is here. Good evening. Good evening, councillors. This is for our regular uh, annual maintenance and licensing for our computer-aided dispatch and record, record management software. Motion to recommend Mr. favorable. On the motion. On the motion, Council Dubois. Hello, Deputy Chief. How are you? Good evening. Good. How are you? So I'm so happy that I get to be state representative because I get to see how West Bridgewater and East Bridgewater run their show. And I've gotten the most detailed information about ambulance receipts and how they are planning to pay for two engines based <coughs> on ambulance receipts. So um, see, how many engines are we down and how many fire trucks are we down right now? Uh, well, the receipts that we get for our ambulances is for dispatch purposes only. That's the way that the contract is negotiated. So I don't think that you could actually uh, get into But how many that. are we down now, trucks? Oh, we're, we're critically down one ladder truck and following on many more. Okay. So what I, I'd like to do is I'd like to share this information with you. Sure. Um, and maybe we can recalibrate how you're able to use this money because we're talking millions of dollars that they're able to retain to be able to purchase these, um, you know, extremely important uh, pieces of equipment. And since there isn't any interest at the executive level to bond these things out and to actually give you the equipment you need, I think we have to start thinking um, out of the box to make sure that the fire department is safe and the people that live in Brockton are safe and have the equipment that if their house is burning down, there's someone there to come and help them. So this is getting to be beyond critical for me. And so I'm going to send this over to you and maybe we can figure out a way that we can have some, you know, self-determination and make sure that your men and women are safe on the job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Council. We happy to review that. Thank you. Any Our second other? council is, uh, to what to pass was uh, motion. Okay. Any other any other comments and uh, motion been made and seconded to uh, send it back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed. Goes back to the full city council. Favor recommendation. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Number seven. Uh, number eight. Eight. I'm sorry. I'm off. My Order apologies. transfer 90000 from the fire department ambulance receipts to the fire department capital projects for the 9-11 next generation mandated <coughs> system upgrade of the secondary PSAP for purchase of three fire alarm operator positions. This will allow for receipt of all transferred 9-11 calls from the soon to be upgraded 9-11 generation system at the police station relating to fire and EMS incidents with all available necessary information. Invited Honorable May Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer, and Richard Francis, Chief of Police. Chief. Again, Councilors, this is to upgrade our 911 equipment at the fire department that was installed in 1994. This will be our first major full system upgrade. Uh, this money comes from our ambulance receipts to uh, provide fire department dispatch. Councilor DiNapoli. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Deputy Chief. How Councilor. are you tonight? Uh, just to uh, uh, refresh my memory, <coughs> we we use a private ambulance company in this city, correct? Yes, we do. Yes. Now, I f strike me if I'm correct. East Bridgewater, West Bridgewater have their own ambulances. That's correct. So the situation that Councilor Dubois mentioned, <coughs> they obtain, I'm sure they bill the people where we do not because of a private ambulance company that we hire. That's correct. Okay. Now, we receive from the ambulance company, what, about 100 grand a year from them? No, it's uh, at this point... In the area of $400,000 a year, oh, and that's similar. to provide them with a dispatch service. Their ambulances that they own and staff are under our full and complete control. So we dispatch those ambulances 24-7, and as a dispatch fee, there's a lot of the costs associated with that that we're talking about so far today, plus all the personnel and time and training. Uh, the ambulance company provides us with a, uh, a fee. A fee to provide that dispatch. Okay, do, 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 does the fire department retain all of the money that they received? Uh, the money's distributed as the, as the mayor and JC fit with the chief, if they want to speak on that. Just on that bit. Uh, council, what happens is that money comes into a restricted fund, the ambulance dispatch fund. It builds up until the council appropriates it. So it doesn't get spent by the fire department unless there's an appropriation. Typically, a good portion of it is used in supporting the dispatch function in the annual budget. And then any additional that comes in in the course of the year is available for certain purposes. And that's what but I'm it stays within the fire department itself, Jay, right? Well, it stays within a special fund and can only be spent with appropriation by city council. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you, uh, Councilor. Any other councilors? Mr. Stewart? President. Oops. Mr. Chairperson. Councilor Stewart. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, good evening. Good, good evening. to see you. Just questions about the upgrade. So it's ninety thousand dollars. Is that exclusively software upgrades, or are there physical upgrades? That will be uh, software and hardware. And, and is there a sense of how long this upgrade will last? What's no, I life? believe that the city of Brockton is going to be in the second round of this. Uh, the first one has already been installed. The <coughs> first installation in the state just happened very recently, and we're supposed to be in the second wave. So it's obviously with the first one just going in. I'm sure they're going to find a lot of bumps and. Uh, unanticipated situations that are going to have to be resolved by the time they get to us. I see. So it's not an immediate thing. <coughs> I see. And you said the original <coughs> software was installed in 1990. 1994 is when the this equipment that we have now was installed. Okay. So the idea that the $90,000, what's the lifespan of this $90,000 investment? Well, that's a good question. Um, a lot of this is being driven by text messaging, um, the advent of smartphones. So smartphones are advancing so fast, computer technology is advancing so fast, that it's going to be very difficult for us to um, predict how long this will last. I doubt it will last the same amount of time our original equipment lasted, uh, almost you know, over 30 years. Right, which I can't imagine either. I mean, that'd be interesting to find out. I'm assuming there's some data on how long, what the lifespan is for this equipment. I'd just be curious to know as, as part of saying yes to this this order yeah we, we actually we just were notified as of about a month ago that we needed to do this the state had put it out there that they were going to be making this upgrade and we received a uh, a, a telegram that said sorry you're out uh, you're gonna to have to pay for this on your own we're fighting this along with 52 other cities and towns to see if we can recover this uh, places like New Bedford Quincy Brockton Bridgewater we're all given this letter uh, from the state 911 department so the uh, Fire Chiefs Association and the Firefighters Association are both working at the state level to see if these monies will be recovered at a later date. But we need to step forward and put this money forward. Uh, state 911 wants an answer right away. Right. I can understand. Um, so just the request would be if you could um, investigate what the lifespan is for this yes. investment and email the body here, it would be great. great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Dubois. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I, my question is for Mr. Condon. I'm sorry, Deputy great. Chief. Thank you very much. Mr. Condon, how much money is in the ambulance dispatch fund right now? About four hundred and something thousand dollars. Thank the beginning, you. Beginning of April. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Any other questions, Council Bonds? Yes, uh, Deputy Chief. Since '94, how many other times? Just so I can be clear, just how many other times have you been? Have how many times has the state required an upgrade in this system since uh, then? I've only been managing that Brockton Fire Department communications for a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the first I know of of a full system upgrade. Uh, everything from now past to 94, all the documentation that I have is more maintenance. They'll fix this, they'll fix that. One certain thing gets changed. This is a full system wipeout where they're going to disconnect. That's the thing is even if we decide not to go forward, we're out. Right. So you're either in or you're out. The whole system as it exists today will be shut off. And do you know, um, are they going to a, a more centralized system like an Apple or one of those? You mentioned something about this a is smartphone. Gonna be is it going to be connected to like a, a program? Yeah, this is network-based as opposed to telephone copper wire-based. Okay. This will be via routers and uh, network technology, fiber optics, that type of stuff. And is there a motherboard or something for this? Or some, like a motherboard or some central office or central, I, I guess, service provider is what I'm, I'm Yeah, asking. I'm not sure where the central office of this will be. Uh, mm -hmm. For the city of Brockton, the hub will be at the Brockton Police Department. I'm not sure if there's going to be a statewide hub mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the network, but I know the local hub will be at the Brockton Police Station. I'm just thinking you know, if this is the first time that it's been a whole system-wide wipeout, if there's some kind of state contract or something with a, a bigger provider. Um, well, this is a very big provider. This is a very big contract. And with very small fish in this barrel. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Also, Council. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Council. Any other motion? To recommend favor. Second. Motion been made and second to recommend back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed. Goes back to the full city council with favorable recommendation. Madam Clerk, item number nine. Order that pursuant to the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53, E and a half, the City Council authorizes an amendment to the previously authorized fiscal year 2015 abandoned building revolving fund, allowing expenditures made on the authority and direction of the Brockton Building Commissioner to be increased from no more than 75000 to no more than 250000 Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, James Cassieri, Superintendent of Buildings. <coughs> Good evening, Mr. Commissioner. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good, thank uh, you. 
any presentation or yeah uh, right now as the ordinance is written I'm mobile only able to spend seventy five thousand dollars out of the fund and currently I've already maxed that out so I'm unable to spend any more this year and we have a lot of anticipated uh, as you know, the, your constituents will be calling you about vacant buildings that they want cleaned up or something done to them. I won't be able to respond to that unless we increase this fund. Understandable. Councilors? Councilor Cruz? Thank you. The money coming into it, if you could just remind the public where the, where the funds in the fund come from. Right. Well, it, it's not taxpayer money in the way that it, if you don't have a vacant property, you don't have to pay into this fund. The people who pay in own a vacant building or uh, a uh, abandoned building so they they uh, charge a fee and those fees go into this fund with the purpose of when there's a situation uh, last year we've removed three dangerous swimming pools that the fences that had been down and the mosquitoes were infesting the neighborhoods uh, we've cleaned up properties and removed graffiti and board up buildings and things of that nature and it's paid for by the people who own vacant properties. This is the ordinance that we pass where they have to register those abandoned properties? Correct. And then do we get this money back? Do we put a lien on them so when the building is sold? Yeah, well right now we have um, 525 vacant or abandoned properties in Brockton. Um, not all of those people have paid, so those properties are liened. Also, the monies we've spent on the property is lien. So right now we have about $400,000 owed to us in liens. Wow. We have 290 available right now, and I've maxed out and can't spend any more. So we're, we need to see when we, when we did the ordinance, we didn't realize what we were really getting into. I think we were maybe even a little naive and thought 75 was plenty, and it yeah. turns out that it's not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You. Councilor Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. My colleague actually... Uh, Good intuition asked many of the questions. We I, think alike we, all, the time. all the time. My <laughs> brother from another mother. Uh, I do have a question about interest on, so if we were, if the city is paying a certain amount of money at this time to um, um, address the issues in those properties, but we're then getting the money back 10 years from now because Correct. that money's being leaned, how are we filling the gap between the, the expense of doing the work now and being paid <clears throat> 10 years from now or well you have to pay now. every year if, if you own a vacant property your first year that we recognize it as vacant you pay hundred and fifty dollars if you do nothing with it the second year you pay three hundred next year is five hundred then a thousand then it goes up to fifteen hundred dollars so the the fees are constantly coming in the, the, the fund will never go down I only anticipate it growing I see so does that answer your question I think so. so it sounds like the fees that are accumulating over time actually exceed potentially the cost of maintaining the property. So when we are paid, right. it's And there's an incentive to do something with sooner. that property. Right, got it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Kassiri. Yep. Uh, Mr. Kassiri, relative to the increase of 175,000, uh, it will bring it to a quarter of a million dollars. Are you, are you confident that 250 grand is gonna be enough to sustain it? Yeah, you know, you can have an incident where uh, 121 Main Street, for instance, we spent almost $68,000 on that building in one shot when we had to remove the facade on that building because it was falling into the sidewalk. So can I say that 250 will be enough? We don't know if some event takes place where we have to remove a vacant building that's in danger of collapse. Maybe that, that one demolition could cost <coughs> $150,000. But under normal circumstances, I think 250 would would be good and i think that we're talking about when we do our budget this year we're going to request that for next year as well and maybe moving forward we'll keep it at 250, at 250. and if that's not enough we can <coughs> adjust it as we go in ter thank you for that in terms of the uh, the annual registration so let's just say bank of america owns full rock metal drive in brockton mm. so they pay the annual fee is there any concern that I mean, they're paying a fee relative to Full Rock Metal Drive. Is there any concern that that money's being, in essence, commingled with other funds that Bank of America has also? <coughs> they own a portfolio of properties, right? Yeah. And they do an annual registration fee designated to a specific property. Mm -hmm. And how much is the registration fee? It depends on how many years it's been vacant. 
If it's been vacant for three years, they owe us five hundred dollars. All right, so five hundred bucks. Yeah. But but is there any concern that that five hundred dollars isn't being used specific to that property? Reason I ask this question is, I I know under the um, the AG when Coakley was the AG, we were doing the receiver program. That this issue had come up, not in Brockton, uh, but elsewhere in the Commonwealth. And I just didn't know has that come up at all here? Nope. Okay. I haven't had that. Something we might want to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. If nobody else was chairman, I had one other question that I think Jay. If let's say we do get a, get money back from a leaned property right. four years from now, is this are we able to put that into this fund, or does it go in the general fund? Or um, under I mean, what's the Department of Revenue say? I, 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 like I that? have to research that to tell you the truth. Um, I, I think probably when there is a payment with a tax receivable, which has got some other fees leaned onto it that is distributed back to the various funds where uh, the lien came from. So this fund would get the benefit of that. Through water bills, the fund, that fund would get the be benefit of that as well. But if it comes pursuant to a foreclosed property where we actually own it at that point, I think all of that money goes to the general fund. But to be sure- That would that be I if we to took it in tax title, you mean? Yeah, that's right. But at the moment where you've uh, got a delinquent tax and then you lien a fee onto that, but we haven't foreclosed on the property, that money all goes back to, I think, to the funds where they uh, where, where it should be distributed. But only if, I, I guess I'm just trying to think, and I mean, it doesn't really matter, we'd still be getting the money, but let's say we had spent $10,000, you think we could just put it right back in this fund? If we haven't foreclosed on the property and auctioned it off as a tax, uh, a tax, tax possession title. sale, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor. Any other questions, councilors? Go ahead, motion to recommend Mr. favorably. On the, Second. On the motion, motion Councilor Duvall. Um, did you say how much money is in this fund right now? Uh, around 290000 Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Motion's been made and seconded to send back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed goes back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Adam Clerk, number 10. Order that the City Council of the City of Brockton hereby approves and directs the holding of an election on May 12, 2015 for its residents to vote on whether to permit the operation of a gaming establishment at the site of the Brockton Fairgrounds, notwithstanding that a new positive determination of suitability may not yet have been issued to the Mass Gaming and Entertainment LLC and its related qualifiers for the Massachusetts Gaming Commission by such date. Invited Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor, Michael Connolly, Attorney, Mintz, Levin, Cohen, Can Ferris, Lofsky, and Pope, PC Law Office. Good evening, Mr. Nazarella. Good evening. Mr. Chairman, I file this. Uh, close. Thank you. Uh, it came to our attention uh, a week or so ago that the state has a uh, the positive determination of suitability, which all of the people involved have been cleared before, but because this is a second, a, a different uh, piece of property from what they were cleared for, the state hasn't issued that yet. It may not be out before May 12th. It's my understanding, Mr. Nazarella, it's f pretty much a, uh, a formality at this point, but because it hasn't been issued, we need to notify the voters. Is, is that my understanding? That is correct. Um, that is correct. And, and we don't expect any issue with that, but the state in the bureaucratic uh, speed basically right. just has we, not we issued it yet. We don't anticipate any issue with the state as well in ultimately making the declaration of suitability. It's just the process it has to go through. But because it, has, it doesn't appear it'll be out before May 12th, as I read this, they'll actually have to send letters to all the voters explaining that, correct? That is correct. At their own, at their cost? At their cost. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, Councilor. Any questions for the attorney? I think it's very straightforward. It it's, sounds like a little housekeeping uh, issue to Motion to, me. to approve. Second. Second. Motion's been made and seconded to send back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? That goes back <coughs> to the full city council. Favor recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Madam Clerk, number 11. Order that the City of Brockton Government Study Committee is hereby established to be a comprised of seven citizens of the city, three of whom are to be appointed by the mayor and four of whom are to be appointed by the city council president. Each committee member shall be a registered voter and to the extent possible possess expertise or knowledge relevant to the work of such government study committee. 
the GSC is charged with exploring by whatever means it deems appropriate all aspects of local government, organization, and structure, the strengths and the weaknesses in Brockton's current form of government, and areas for improvement, alternative models of government, and recommend changes in such organization and structure, including but not limited to the terms of the office and the method of selection of officials consistent with the needs of the city and designed to achieve greater efficiency and effectiveness in the delivery of government services. Invited Jazz Stewart, Councilor at Large. Council Stewart. Mr. Chairperson, thank you. As you are aware, um, I filed this um, order last year with the hopes that we could form a body to look at uh, the structure of the city government, which has not been reviewed in over 50 years, uh, to ensure that it's structured in a way that, ensure, that makes sure the city is competitive, uh, efficient, uh, and represents the best interest of taxpayers. My colleagues had some concerns about the way the original order was drafted. Um, those Principally, the two concerns were um, ensuring that this um, study group um, recommendations were non-binding, uh, but simply recommendations, and that secondly, the concerns around uh, the diversity and the makeup of the study group and in ensuring that diversity was one of the important um, <coughs> Uh, inquiries of the group. Uh, so I've, I would like to offer a few, a couple of amendments to what has been written in hopes that it will satisfy my colleagues and okay. we can get this pushed through. Uh, I would also mention, as you know, I'm retiring from politics this year and no. so I know it's <laughs> sad to say. Uh, and it ain't so. <laughs> Um, so I uh, would also like to, I've spoken to my colleague uh, Shana Barnes to see if she can actually co-sponsor this order so that um, as I, we anticipate this will take longer than uh, the end of this year, uh, calendar year. So I'd like to continue my role on the group as a citizen and ensure that there's a counselor who's uh, co-chairing this, this group and she's um, agreed to take on that role as well. Very good. So okay. I'd like to offer this amendment if, if, there, are, if there are questions, maybe. Um, I can just go ahead and... Anyone have any questions? Councilor Sullivan. Uh, <clears throat> for you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Councilor, I just had a question relative to the... Uh, I, I, I like the, uh, the ambition that you have on this, but I guess my confusion level is relative to <clears throat> typically uh, when a municipality wants to make a change relative to the <laughs> charter, there'll be a charter commission, charter <laughs> review commission. And uh, we've done this since you've been on the council, and I've been on this council. We've done home rule petitions up at the state house. Some are favorable, some are not favorable. But I guess that's where I'm somewhat confused. And w when I stood where council president is last year, um, I, I, I didn't question this. But I just have a question relative to how, how we can circumvent the scope of a home rule petition. I know this isn't a binding. This isn't binding at all, what you're proposing. But I guess I'm confused. If you're going to attempt to make a change, why wouldn't you just do the process to actually make the change? I just feel like this is step one of, <coughs> of a two-step process. And I, I'm just somewhat confused if you could clarify on that, Councilor. Sure. Uh, Thank minutes, you. Three years, Chairperson. Councils, Councils, I had extensive conversations with our legal counsel, Mr. Gilday, about the best way forward uh, and establishing a charter review committee uh, at the um, onset would be a very lengthy process and mm -hmm. potentially highly political considering that that committee's recommendations would be um, would take us to the next level of trying to amend the, the charter and so he and I discussed this and felt that if there were a committee that could offer do a lot of the early research work and sort of clear the decks on what is what is doable in a reasonable amount of time um, that it's very likely that we would then um, establish a charter review committee which would have a, a lot of that research work already at hand and so that would move the process forward more quickly uh, in addition to uh, the charter review committee you can also go right to a um, home rule petition as was mentioned by my colleague um, so this is really a group that can act more nimbly um, and more efficiently and can present some recommendations um, very, very relatively quickly compared to having the <coughs> Charter Review Committee do all this work from the very beginning. Thank you, Councilor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Co Councilor Dubois. Um, I just have a couple comments. I'm, I'm so opposed to this. I feel like it's a circumventing of open government. If there's a process to change the charter of uh, organization of a government, we should be following the process, not setting up a committee of seven unelected people to make decisions. If, if you think a charter review committee is politically 
uh, charge? You don't think a random ad hoc group of seven people appointed by the mayor and the city council president, nobody being elected by the actual people that pay taxes in this <coughs> city to make the determinations as a starter of what the Charter Review Committee is going to do isn't political? I don't know um, what lenses you're looking through. I think this is bad for Brockton. I think it's bad for the citizens of Brockton. If the citizens of Brockton don't see this, I'm going to make sure that they do because seven people who are unelected should not be making the decisions on where Brockton goes in the future. That's a statement. I hope my fellow councillors vote this down. And I think this is a really bad, bad form of government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Dubois. So through you, Mr. Chairperson, as you know, those meetings are uh, all will be open to the public for public uh, participation. And also the recommendations are non-binding. And so I think it's uh, a good way to sort of tee up the to have a conversation and the work for uh, a review committee. It, it could be determined that there are very few, if any, viable um, alterations to the charter. And so instead of establishing a major process to come to that conclusion, uh, this seems to be a, a very efficient way to, to get us to that point. And clearly from that, that point of those, of those recommendations, which if, if, if there are some where people are encouraged by, um, the charter review committee process, of course, is, is public. Right, exactly. Yeah, like Councils, any, any other before? <coughs> Council, Council Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the uh, City Council at large. Uh, I still have some reservations over this in terms of the, uh, the selection process. Uh, I voiced this out last time that you, when, you, when you first brought this up. Uh, as you know, that there's a, a great number of people in this community that basically are kept out of, this whole, the, out of the entire process in city government, in boards and commissions. So I don't see this actually uh, delineating or, or, or skewing too far away from that whole thinking. But another major concern that I have with this is that you talk about uh, putting together this committee, but at the same time, it talks about making recommendations, but recommendations to whom? Uh, when you look at it, um, is, the, is the recommendations going to the mayor? Is it coming back to the city council? Is it going back to some sort of uh, a board and commission somewhere? Uh, I don't think it's very clear in terms of who does this recommendation go to. And I can see the danger behind this because you've got a body of citizens uh, standing somewhere saying, you know, we think that X, Y, and Z should be done. And yet somehow the council or the mayor deciding otherwise, I think you're open we are opening ourselves up for all kinds of issues. So I think it has to be very clear as to who, to whom the uh, recommendations go to. And if that's the case, um, I think that we have to kind of reconsider the entire reappointment of these individuals into those committees. Because if they're just gonna go and recommend to the mayor a particular move, you've got three people appointed by the mayor, don't have a problem with the, with the mayor, but I'm just saying in the future, you've got four people appointed by the council that technically is the majority of the group and you, you can have a real uh you know drag out you know knuckle dragging type of a situation here when you've got bodies kind of in in conflict in the sense because it's not very clear as to whom or how this body actually decides on what happens in this in this particular committee and i think you have to clean you know kind of clean that up a little bit so through the through the chair, yes. So the recommendations so will be made uh, to, to this body. We can amend it to make it very clear that that's the case. Okay. Council Bonds, did you have a comment? Yes, if I could, just, just a comment. Um, in support of my colleague, um, Councillor Stewart, and he and I spoke about this, and like he said, I, I've agreed to, to join this with him in um, trying to get this enacted in the city. I think we have to be careful projecting the failure of what could come from this group. And, and also, too, to Councilor Rodriguez through the chair, if, if I may, any board or commission uh, could fall into that pitfall that you were just talking about. And, and to Councilor Dubois, they're not elected either. And you have some folks that are, you know, are appointed from um, the, the council, as in last year, with the Water Commission, um, and then you know, some of the other boards and commissions that are appointed by the mayor. Those, they're, they're fluid, they change, but the recommendations that come out, neither of those are binding either. They're just recommendations. So I, I think if we can kind of just think a little bit about the purpose of it, and, and as I was talking uh, with Councillor Stewart, 
focusing it and streamlining it also just to make it very, very clear as to what the goal of the creation of this group is. And I just kind of want to caution um, the projected failure of this so soon, and, and it hasn't even gotten off the ground. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Bonds. Councilor Stidens. I, I have trepidations about this in particular, no, no. and I'm going to read from it. The GSC, which is the Government Study Committee, is charged with exploring by whatever means it deems appropriate. <coughs> Those words just kill me. Aspects of local government organization and structure. I, I, I don't think that's not, and I'm not a, there's no way that I'm a micromanager. But that is just not proper verbiage to be putting something that's supposed to be within a free society. There's no way I can vote for this. Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Mr. Council Chairman. Sense, you Thank, Thank you, you Council. very much, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Dubois. Just if, as a follow-up, I mean, you just have to go to the Massachusetts MassGov website to see that our state has a process, <coughs> two different processes for changing your charter. And first is petitioning the legislature, and second is electing, not appointing <coughs> by people. It's electing a home rule charter commission election. That's what democracy is about. It isn't taking the people in charge and having them appoint their people with their same point of view to decide what's good for everybody else that lives in the city. And I move to table this. Uh, oh, Mr. Just point of information. Um, there was no second to. No second on my table. Uh, okay, that's fine. Point of information. So yeah, once again, this group is going to make recommendations. And so the next step, if those recommendations again, sort of soften the, the research of this work is to either, as I mentioned earlier, do a home rule petition or to um, establish a charter group. With that said, uh, Mr. President, I'm happy to have this vote. And if, it, it, if it's a vote that's positive or negative, I'm happy with that. But I'd like to, to go ahead and move forward on the vote with the amendments I'd like to offer based on my conversation so that, well, well, that um, I that know would, where it stands. That would be my next stand. If you're going to make amendments, then we need to hear the amendments, and then we'd have to take it from there to, if they're voted in or not, and, and then we can move it forward to whichever direction. Those amendments, uh, Council? Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so the first amendment would be deleting the word and before the words the method of selection of officials and after such words adding an increasing diversity in city government. And number two, deleting the following. If the committee recommends changes in the form of government, it shall present a draft charter proposal as part of its report <coughs> and inserting in place thereof the following. The recommendation shall, shall be non-binding. Um, what was not anticipated, but I'm happy to also strike from the document is um, Mr. Studensky's concern, and I'd like to strike by whatever means it deems appropriate. So it would read, the GSC is charged with exploring all aspects of local government organization and structure and so forth. So those are the three amendments, Mr. Chairperson. Those are the three amendments that have been uh, presented. You have a copy of that so that the clerk can have, uh, have that? I'll need to write, hand write the if third one put that in so that based on Mr. Stadinsky's concern. Those are the three amendments um, that he's uh, forwarding. Um, do I have them? I'll second it. Motion's been made. On the motion. Second. On the motion pertaining to the amendments. Councilor Rodriguez. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I believe in the conversation that I had with Council Stewart on this particular aspect of things. That I don't entirely disagree with the, with the need to do what we're trying to do here. I just think that it's something that we're, we're biting way too much more than we can actually chew at this time. And I think it needs to be a little more focused so that it's not all over the place. Because I, I believe when you look at a commission that's going to come in and basically recommend the change of the entire city government, uh, to me, that kind of leaves a little bit, um, a little too much on the table in the sense. So it, as a recommendation to the council, to the councilor, I would say, that he should basically maybe postpone this uh, particular measure before it really kind of uh, goes down in flames in the sense where people are just basically voting against it. But at least it'll give us some time to kind of look at it instead of kind of throwing out, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, because again, uh, the question that I had, it's not delineated on the order in terms of who gets this recommendation <clears throat> and what is done with this recommendation once we get that. Because we don't want to get into a, you know, a contest where uh, a body provides you with a particular recommendation and you're basically fighting against that recommendation. And to go um, 
with what Councillor Barnes was saying in terms of, you know, that is true with other committees, but remember, when the mayor appoints a committee, we actually have a say in who becomes part of that committee or doesn't become part of that committee. So I'm not exactly sure, even if the appointments made by the mayor on this particular committee comes in front of the, uh, the city council for its approval as well, because it's, it doesn't say that. So that's why I'm, I'm bringing that up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Council Roderick. Councilor, Councilor Dubois, and then Council Monahan. On the motion, which is pertaining to the amendments. Right. On the motion as to why I don't think that the amendments actually fulfill any of my concerns about this actually following a democratic process, I just want to read from Mass General Laws how you're supposed to actually change a charter, which sounds actually democratic. Um, it's election of a home rule charter commission election, which leads to what is often referred to as a home rule rule charter, a commission of nine elected members um, form the frame of a charter, and 15, uh, in, in 16, 16 months a preliminary report has to be um, given, and 18 months a final report, and there's actually um, a chapter of Mass General Laws that gives excruciating detail on how the charter elected charter commission is supposed to operate. What, what the amendments don't do and what this order doesn't do is give any of the safeguards that the residents pay taxes for to make sure that the city just isn't taken over by seven people that are appointed by whoever. No offense to any of the people that are appointing them. I would say it if I was appointing them. So I just think that we should just vote no on all of this because I really think it's a, it's a disgrace to democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Council Moynihan. Yeah, I just want to say that I think probably the best thing would be to postpone this because I think this is going down if we vote on it tonight. Maybe streamline a little, little bit, take into consideration what uh, Councilor uh, Rodriguez said, and maybe uh, just streamline it, get it to where you want it to be, so that well, whoever, if they're happy or not with it, will be happy with it, and just go from there. That's just be my recommendation. So Thank Mr. you, Councilor. On, on the motion, still Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of things, Councilors. Uh, bear in mind, it, it couldn't go down tonight. The only thing that could happen tonight could be an unfavorable recommendation back to the full city council. What, what I do think uh, is only one of 11, but what I do think uh, we need is we need our legislative council attorney, Gilday, to, uh, to give his, his opinion on this. Um, because, again, Councilor Stewart did spend a lot of time on this endeavor. Uh, I, I have some strong concerns about it, but um, you know, to have legislative counsel here, and he, he, by all means, Mark is always here, but he doesn't need to be here at FinCom. He'll be here at the full city council. So I think the best thing would be to, uh, if, if it's not postponed, I think it should go back to the council for, uh, for next Monday night, and we'll have our attorney here, and we can vet it out at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Sullivan. We're still on the amendments that were presented, the three amendments that uh, Councilor Stewart presented, so we need a vote on the amendment first. So all in favor of the order as amended with those amendments? All in favor of the amendments. Amendments, I'm sorry. All in favor of the amendments. All opposed? I think you can do the math, but um, at that point we don't have any uh, anything there it, 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 to go back with any amendments. So now what is your take to what so you'd Mr. Like Sherpers, to do? I'm, I'm comfortable with the vote taking place and if we want to, and if it, is, if it goes back to the full city council um, unfavorably, we can still have Mr. Gilday speak to the group in the full city council session. Okay, so. so I wanna go forward with the vote. Okay, motion's been made. Do I have a second to go back to the? I'll second it. Second to go back to the uh, full. No, you, haven't had, you haven't had a motion yet. So I like the motion. I like the motion to have it uh, go to the full city council favorably, Mr. President. Okay. So motion's been made. I'll second it. Second like to go back call. to the full city council, and I was going to request that a roll call be taken on this a particular order, Madam Clerk. Shirley Azak. Yes. Shana Barnes. Yes. Timothy Cruz. No. Dennis Denapoli. No. Michelle Dubois? No. Dennis Ianeri? No. Tom Monahan? No. Moises Rodriguez? No. Jazz Stewart? Yes. Paul Studensky? No. Robert Sullivan? No. Three yeas, eight nays. Goes back to the full city council with an unfavorable recommendation. Madam Clerk, next item. <clears throat> 
Order that in accordance with Chapter 23, Section 30, F6 of the Revised Ordinances of the City of Brockton, the City Council approves the Brockton Water Commission recommended a 30% increase, 15% water incre rate increase effective July 1, 2015, and another 15% increase effective July 1, 2016. The increase will address the current needs of the Water Division, including but not limited to the capital projects, EPA, DEP mandates, and Aquaria contract services, as well as personal services. Invited Honorable <coughs> Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Lawrence Riley, DPW Commissioner, Ozzy Jordan, Chairman, Water Commission. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mr. Jordan. How are you? Very well. Good evening. Good evening. John. John Thank Paul. you. You're welcome. <coughs> Uh, I'd like to have Mr. Creighton pace, uh, pass out some of the material that we're using this evening. I'd like to have uh, Dan Murphy, of one of the commissioners, present about a five to seven minute um, PowerPoint view for you for your for information. And then after that, we can have some discussion on this. In the meantime, uh, you'll have a copy of all the slides that he's uh, presenting this evening. Thank you. All right, counselors, there's a handout going up around, and then we will have a... Uh Please, a quick five, seven minute uh, presentation as well. Is it all one? Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. Thank you. I got an extra one here. I think it's a, I think it's up truck. I think it's those three, that's how it goes. I could be <coughs> Thank you. All right. Good evening and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Um, my name is Dan Murphy. I live at five fifteen Tory Street. I am a water commissioner on the Brockton Water Commission and it's my honor to uh, to present this uh, slides. Uh, to you. Go ahead, Mr. Mr. Jordan, next slide. The other button. You have to do the space bar. Just a quick agenda for uh, what we're going to take you through in this presentation. We're going to talk very briefly about Enterprise Fund Basics. I know you're all veterans and uh, are probably very familiar with it anyway, so we won't spend much time there. I'd like to go over some of the capital needs that we have in the Water Department. We'd like to speak a little bit about the Brockton Water Commission budget and its constraints. Uh, some information from the MWRA 2014 Annual Water Sewer Retail Rate Survey. Uh, an example rate increase scenario so that you can see what the order of magnitude of the request that we're making and uh, some final recommendations in conclusion. Next slide, please. As you know, the enterprise fund is, uh, is used to separately account for municipal services of a proprietary nature. In this case, the water department. The expenses of the water department must be paid by the revenues of the water department. Um, so that you can track those expenses, so that you can account for those expenses, so that you can generate revenue for those expenses. Uh, the revenues and expenses are, are segregated, dealt with separately in a separate account. And uh, surplus is kept by the enterprise fund at year end, <coughs> categorized as retained earnings and can be used later on for specific purposes. Some of the capital needs that we have in the city are quite urgent. We need to replace the Tory Street main uh, which is under an administrative consent order from the Department of Environmental Protection because thresholds of a byproduct of treatment have exceeded the allowable limits at the Torrey Street pump station um, beyond what's allowed. Uh, not a lot, but beyond their limit. The Tina Avenue main replacement is well overdue. That's not gonna happen. And that's going to be a, a cost of $1.5 million that's been carried in the budget but deleted or, or withdrawn uh, for the past three years. The clear well at the water treatment plant, the clear well is where the, the finished processed water is stored before distribution through the city. And the uh, delayed maintenance in the clear water tank has caused spalling of concrete, which if left any further is gonna cause concrete to fall into our treated water, 
which would obviously defeat its purpose. The Court Street Bridge pro crossing, there's a main that needs to be replaced there. It costs for about $250,000. And a main on Norwich Road that needs to be replaced, $550,000. The total of these projects is $6.8 million. And there are also additional water storage improvements that have not been uh, addressed at this point, And we are not including in this presentation, but they do need to happen. Uh, the water tanks need to be painted every eight to 10 years or so in order to keep them in their best shape. They haven't been painted in 15 years from my understanding. Further note from the uh, Department of Environmental Protection, upon their review of our Brockton Public Water Supply report, they stated that the department recommends that Brockton consider instituting a water main replacement program. Benefits to a methodical replacement program could extend the improvements listed in the report for the Tory Street project to the citywide system. The city actually did do a water main replacement program uh, for some time where they would replace a certain number or a certain number of feet of, of water main per year. Uh, they had to drop that system when they lost the crews because of underfunding of the department. Now they do, any water replacement is done by contractors, which obviously cost more when they can get to do that. A quick look at the Water Commission budget that is before you today. We show expenses of $20 million, 36,160, with expected 2015 revenues of $16,639,978, which leaves a budget shortfall of $3,396,182. This budget shortfall can be made up in, in a few different ways. One of those is through a rate increase, borrowing, or use of retained earnings. It's my understanding that at this point we have approximately $2.1 million in retained earnings that would be applied to this budget. Go ahead. According to uh, an MWRA 2014 rate survey, this is a, a survey that they do on a regular basis, um, the American Water Works Association industry standard usage, so that they compare apples to apples when they look at what different communities are paying and receiving. They use a 120 HCF or 100 cubic feet, which equates to approximately 90,000 gallons of use. The average cost of water and sewer at this usage for 2014 was $1,428.92 in the MWRA service area. This was a, an increase of 3.5% over 2013. The cost of Brockton residents based on that AWWA standard usage is $889. And as you know, the last Brockton water rate increase was in 2008. You'll notice on the executive summary, one of the things that we added to that list is that in that 2008 rate increase, there was a rate evaluation that recommended that there be a 60% rate increase in 2009, a 7% increase in 2010, and a 7% increase in 2011 in order to accommodate the, the expenses related to the desalination plant. The 60% was implemented, but the two following 7% increases were never implemented. <coughs> This is just a, uh, a page from the MWRA 2014 rate survey. You can't really see it all that well. It's just the data about Brockton's, Brockton's rates, last increase in 2008, current rates, things like that. Hopefully you'll be able to read it better in your handout. This shows uh, a relative comparison of the, um, the, the water rates in a number of communities. And uh, you can see Brockton is the, is the one next to the arrow. It kind of falls in the middle of this group at $889. Other communities with less, other communities with more. The next slide is just an alphabetic listing of uh, a number of communities. And what you'd see in there is that our very few communities had 0% increase over the last year. Many, most communities had some form of an increase, which is the way that uh, you'd like <coughs> to do that with an enterprise fund. Um, expenses and revenue should be an <coughs> reviewed annually and slight adjustments made. That way you can avoid needing a 30% increase later on. A question was asked at our, our rate survey, I mean uh, our rate hearing. Go ahead. Um, about how Brockton's rate and others compare as a percentage of household median income because it is a, a common 
measure, uh, a common comparison. And this table will show you that uh, Brockton's water rate at $443 for that rate, that usage, um, as compared to the household median income, <coughs> is 0.9%. It should be noted that if you were to increase the water rate by 30%, the percentage of household median income is still 0.90%. It's an insignificant increase as compared to the household median income. And I know that you all care very much uh, for me and my household and my finances. So in a typical household like mine, two adults, three children, all in their teens who like to take showers and have lots of laundry done, uh, my water bill or should I say the, uh, the water bill of that sample family, uh, based on the last quarter times four to annualize it, our annual water sewer refuse bill is approximately $940. The water portion of that bill is $328, which equates to $27 per month. So a 10% rate increase in the water would be $2.70 a month, up to a 30% rate increase, which would be $8.10 per month for my family of five. Uh, it would be a smaller percentage increase of overall water sewer refuse bill. Uh, once you add in the sewer and the refuse, it's approximately a 10% increase on my overall water sewer refuse bill. So again, you have the, uh, the water rate survey table. And if you'll hit that, that key again, Ozzy, this, this just again shows that even with a 30% increase, it still doesn't change its rate among other communities. So in the budget that we showed earlier on, we showed capital projects of 500, I think $75,000. $570,855, half a million of which would be used to replace mains, small mains, uh, at the recommendation of the DEP and to, to get back into replacing some of our undersized um, over-aged water mains. So in looking at a revised budget, I'm sorry, yes, this is, uh, this is a slide that shows you what the estimated revenue increase would be uh, <coughs> based on various levels of increase, from uh, a 3% increase, which would see an additional revenue of $330,000, up to the 30% increase, which would see an additional revenue <coughs> of $3.1 million. So if we were to look at a revised budget, where we took the previously mentioned $6.8 million worth of capital projects that are absolutely necessary and included those in the capital outlay and project category. The total budget would become $26,836,160. As you can see, the capital outlay and projects number has been increased by that $6.8 million. I want to point out also the, uh, the lines in blue on the screen, debt service and expense reimbursement to the general fund. Um, that 4.95 or, or $5 million represents greater than 25% of the budget. And when we have to pay back money that basically creates an ineffective cost structure, um, the general fund shouldn't have had to compensate or shouldn't have had to contribute to the operation of the water department, uh, but had to a couple years back because we were underfunded. So this revised budget of $26.8 million um, not for your consideration here, but just to show you what we can do is for, uh, with additional revenue. Go to the next screen, please, Ozzy. At $26.8 million against the expected 2016 revenues of 16640000 $640,000, that leaves us a budget shortfall of $10.2 million. <coughs> and that budget subsidy could be accommodated through a 30% rate increase, which would give us the $3.1 million in additional revenue. Retained earnings, which again, as estimated right now, is $2.1 million. And then the remainder of the process or, or some of the capital projects could be funded through SRF grants, state revolving fund, for which we are already approved of $4.96 million. Um, it's been suggested that perhaps we do this over a two-year uh, process, 15% per year, and that's, that is what's on the table before you today. Uh, so we can do some of the projects that need to be done immediately through those F SRF grants. Um, so our, our recommendations to you tonight 
are to include capital needs in the 2016 budget. These are projects that absolutely need to take place. Too much maintenance has been deferred. Too many projects have been put off. Too many crews have been cut in order to stay on the black side of the ledger. Fund the budget shortfall with a rate increase, a correction really, and use of retained earnings and SRF funding to pay for some of the critical projects, which we could then repay fairly quickly through that rate increase. The Water Commission requests also regular updates as to total balances in the Water Commission accounts so that we can know what is there and available. And the uh, enterprise fund rates should be considered and adjusted annually to keep up with maintenance and capital needs in the future. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Jordan, anything before I take questions? Uh, just one second. <coughs> I think some of you were around to remember a few years ago we had trouble with the meters and this was a similar situation where for roughly about a nine year period the uh, commission at that time which I was not on or none of the mem present members of the water commission were involved with that but some of you councilors were put us into a very negative position unfortunately across the city. Um, we're barking on that door again or knocking on that door again. Tory Street is something we have to do. If we don't do that, that's going to cost the city money because uh, DEP can turn around and penalize us in fines. So that's just one piece. Um, when we do a main, what we try to do, and I think you're aware of this, but if you're not, the whole street has to be repaired. We do contact the other utilities and try to get gas, electric, or anybody else to come in and do what they need to do at that point. Um, it doesn't make sense to tear up a street a water main in six months eight months whatever later they come back and tear it up for gas or whoever else sometimes we don't we don't always get the cooperation we the way we would like with the other utilities but we try to do our best with that but this is one in particular Tory Street has to be done or otherwise that consent order is a good possibility it could cost us some money to the city itself um, I don't know if you're familiar with a couple other things that are involved here <coughs> Silver Lake itself is in uh, an area that we own down off of Route 3. We have a number of towns down there that we're involved with, Pembroke, Kingston, Plimpton, Hanson, East Bridgewater, Whitman, Avon, Halifax. <coughs> Halifax has a treatment plant. Whitman, we have uh, the entire town we supply water to. Avon, three houses. East Bridgewater, three houses. Hanson, 100 houses. Pembroke nine houses all that's metered all that comes back to us but it is something we're involved with down there and I think pretty soon you may hear from those areas especially those around Silver Lake because we've got a large portion portion of land down there that's owned by the city of Brockton and they'd love to have that water source back so we will be hearing from them so again just just background information cost of living not on one of you here no, by January of next year, a number of bills are going to go up. Does anybody think they weren't? Any counselor? I won't. Yet when it comes in to ask for increases, for some reason, we get the deaf ear. I don't know why, but we do. Um, <coughs> capital needs, there's no question. When we did have money, when we had the crews, we were able to do X amount of uh, miles per year within, within house. Uh, without the increases, it's, it's something that we just, you know, we can't, we can't deal. I know you've got the <coughs> whole city to think about. You have all the departments to think about. One thing, please think about. Water shuts off for five days. What happens to this city? Anybody? Shuts down. Yeah, shut down. Didn't hear you. Shuts down. Right. Shuts down. Number one resource in this city is water. Without it, nothing happens. Yeah, a day, day and a half. Let it go out for a few days and see what happens. Nothing can do. Any job has to shut down. Fire department can't work. None of us can work. <clears throat> this is real. It's not a scary thing. It's just something we need to deal with. Now, there's been a question on the amount. Remember, <coughs> over the years, we haven't had that annual increase that we need to operate this organization. <clears throat> The water, the water side, 
okay? We had originally about three and a half crews. We've got a, a full crew and I think about two or two and a half persons on top of that. If these folks take vacation, if they're out sick, if we have any problems like that, we're in trouble. We can't do what we need to do. We can't work 12 months out of the year. I think a lot of you know we have to shut down during the winter. That's by law, except for emergency. We go in on emergency, but we can't do the normal fixing of mains, et cetera, during the winter months. Uh, just like most building doesn't go on that for that, basically some of that same reasoning. But I know some of the councils look and say, well, 30 percent, 15. We have to figure out a way to keep this working for us across the board. We haven't talked about the individual breakdowns of all the what customers or how we would change to, uh, for each customer. That needs to be done also, okay? But we do need to have an increase. There's no question about that. We've got equipment that none of you, I think, would drive at this point if you weren't working for the water department. You wouldn't drive it as your private vehicle. So I mean, these, these are real things. These aren't, you know, just out of the closet kind of thing. But please, when you're thinking about what you want to do with, with the budget, Think about what we need to do across this city to keep this operational. And the increases we've had, again, with the uh, um, cost of everything. Any questions? I'll ask that question. <clears throat> Councilor DiNapoli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, <clears throat> Mr. Jordan. Good evening. And a nice presentation. First Thank of you. all, I, I'm not going to go off on a tantrum here, but um, I noticed that the uh, Aquaria bill is on this for over $7 million. If they lived up to their end of the bargain, we wouldn't be paying $7 million. <coughs> but we won't go down that road. Before you were on the Water Commission, I've been on this council for 16 years. <coughs> I asked them a long time ago to come in here and ask for a rate. And they, they asked for a rate. Every time they come in here for a rate, it's 10, it's 20, it's 30. We, we, we can't keep doing that. The last rate you got was 2008, correct? Correct. 2008, we're at 2015, that's seven years ago. I will support an increase, but I told you at the meeting that we had at, uh, in the, uh, <coughs> across the hall that only six or seven constituents showed up at that meeting with the board and myself and one other counselor that I'll support an increase but I want a cost of living. I want to give you something every year, whether it's a half a percent, one percent, because you can't do this for the rest of your life, asking for 10, 20, and 30 percent. I agree with you, we need to fix the pipes. We have roads in this city that can't be repaired because the, the pipes in the road have to be replaced. So we can't do streets over again. And I think that's very, very important. Everybody's calling right now. Look at all the money you have to replace streets. We only have what do we get, four million bucks? Doesn't go very far. Um, the other thing is about the MWRA. Uh, maybe years ago, maybe we should have went that road instead of the Aquaria road because the Aquaria contract, like I should say, Jay, just don't send them the check. But um, I know we probably won't get very far with this tonight because you're gonna need an increase. Now I have I have my own ideas where I, I may give you an increase where you may see uh, the 400,000, which is what, 5%? Five, five That's about 5 That's about 5%. Right. The problem that I'm having here, I don't want to hurt the big companies that use a lot of water. I, you know, there's only my wife and I and my daughter living at home, and we don't use much water. But the, the brand new company up on the north side, uh, the linen company, they use a lot of water. Brockton Hospital uses a lot of water. We don't want to penalize businesses that are coming into the city by going up 20% on their water bill. It's, it, it isn't fair. We have to work something out and put everything the game, to, on the table to be fair with everybody. Okay, that, that's, where, that's where I'm coming off. So you know, I, I, I spoke, I said my piece, and I'm sure the other councilors are gonna have a uh, a few questions and answers that they want uh, done on this. But I'm in favor of an increase, but we have to work it out, and I will not support an increase 
if we don't do an automatic increase of a half a percent a year because we just can't continue going down this road. It's just like the city councils want to raise. The last raise they got was 1996. We're in the same boat. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. you. Uh, thank you, Councilor. <clears throat> Councilor Moynihan. Yes. Mr. Connor, please. <clears throat> Good evening, Jake. What, is there anything we, we can do to, so we don't hurt the commercial account so bad? That's, that seems to be an issue. I mean, obviously, we don't want to really. Well, the, uh, the recommendation is for a percentage increase which generates that amount of revenue. I guess a, a $2 million worth of revenue, I think, is roughly what comes in off that, that percentage increase. Though I think what the uh, commissioner said was what needs to be determined in addition to that, if you're going to support that level of increase, is how you distribute that percentage across the different rate blocks. Uh, when the commission completed its hearing and came up with its recommendation that was sent to the city council and also a copy to the mayor, the mayor asked me if I had any way that I could change that recommendation to something which was not as heavy on the lowest users, especially those who are elderly and uh, on fixed incomes. Uh, that issue was also raised at the water rate hearing, and I, I spoke in favor of that. And that didn't say, send the same level of percentage increase to the biggest users in the city who are also some of the largest employers in the city. Well, you're kind of trying to fit a, shoe in, a foot into a shoe of a certain size that makes it kind of difficult. But if you would be willing to accept a phase program of, say, four years instead of two, which generated about $4 million worth of revenue over that four-year period, which is a little bit more than they're looking for over two, and put in place a program which skewed the rate increase more toward the middle rate blocks, and those are homeowners. I don't want to mislead you on th those are homeowners, but not on the larger blocks to the same percentage, you could probably come up with that. If the council's interested in that, I can, I can give you some work because it's, it's just Excel spreadsheets. And if you want to change a percent here, you change the revenues. And if you need to get a little bit more revenue because you favored one group, then you need to change the percents on the others. But basically, I did create a model that did that, it generates about a million dollars a year for next year and a million dollars a year for the year after that and ends up getting you about $4 million in total. And the way I did it was, and one of these things, I think if you're going to do anything, you should probably do, period. And that is, I would put into the rate ordinance a provision that any taxpayer who qualifies for any of the tax abatement uh, programs that are allowed by the state, to get them, they have to apply, apply in the assessor's office. If they qualify for any of those programs, it means they're either elderly or disabled veterans or surviving spouses or very poor. I mean, they, it's pretty tough to qualify for those programs. I would suggest that you do by ordinance a program that said if they qualify, that list gets sent, gets sent to the DPW commissioner, and the DPW commissioner should abate back to the minimum charge their bills. That's not an awful lot of money every year. There's only about 1,000 people who so qualify in the last year's uh, Tax, uh, tax billings, so the amount of water revenue lost to the water department wouldn't be great, but it would protect those folks we know really aren't in a very strong position to pay. They don't look like the median income on that chart that was shown by, uh, by the commissioner. That's something I think we can do regardless of what we do on the rates because those folks ought to be considered as being in a needy status and they're not going to be able to contribute much anyway. We ought to be able to help them. I do like the idea of not being as is heavy on the increase to the largest users because most of them are also significant employers and many of the people that work for them are also Brockton residents. So I don't think you want to be driving some of those users out of the city because they can they find the cost situation too onerous. If you're interested in, in that particular program, it basically doesn't put anything on that first group of, um, of users that are on the minimum block. Puts 20% increase for the first two years on the blocks, the blocks that take you up to 40,000 cubic feet a year, I think that's three blocks as it sits right now, and then much lower percents after that on the higher blocks. Does that for two years, and then at the end, it puts a 10% increase on everybody and a 7.5% increase the following year. It's four years, it's just numbers, we can play with it any way you want. But there is a program there that can get, I think, most of what they're looking for. Now, if you did that, I think, uh, you know, we've got a couple million, as was said, in retained earnings. That will reduce that. We use that every year, uh, counselors. Every year we get it certified by the Department of Revenue. We don't sit on it. It gets applied to each year's water and sewer budget. You see it in the, in the budget hearings. To the extent we qualify for the estate revolving funds, we 
take that into consideration. We bring those dollars in and those revenues get appropriated to the water department's benefit. So we're already doing some of those things. Some of those capital projects could probably be bonded out in order to diminish the immediate impact until we get healthier in our revenue structure. So I think with about a million dollars a year, you could probably get that budget pretty close to being in balance and doing most of the capital work they want to do with borrowing and maybe postponing a couple of those things that aren't under consent decree orders. So if you're interested, I can get you that stuff and we'll, we'll play with it around after that and, and get to whatever kind of program you're, you're comfortable with. But there's nothing that comes free of charge. I mean, we, we, we need to give this department a, a rate increase or else we're really going to be seeing some disastrous circumstances here. So if you do that program, though, <clears throat> we can't we'd have to wait until you get that program in place before you voted on any rate increase or anything. We can't vote on the rate increase if we're going to do that program right now. We'd have to have an ordinance. Well, I can, I can, give, you the, I can give you the spreadsheet. I don't have 11 copies, but I can give you the spreadsheet if somebody wants to make, a, make an, a, an amendment. Right now, all you have is an order to approve not anything except for 30% increase over two years. It doesn't apply to any of the blocks. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you Council Monaghan. Council Bynes. Uh, yes, Mr. Jordan, I believe. <coughs> On the, uh, the subsequent notice, a document that you provided along with the uh, PowerPoint slides, just something in here, the equipment, about the equipment aging, and it was also mentioned, this proposed increase that covers that plus the crews, plus the labor, plus all those other things that have been lacking in the department? Yes, it would. Um, remember, every drop of water is metered. So it's not like people aren't using water, but these other pieces are equipment or personnel to ensure that the water will keep running and running the way we want it to run. Uh, yes, that would take that. And by reducing that amount, all you're doing is stringing it out in one way, but we're also going backwards at the same time because if we don't meet it this year, then it's going to cost us a little more. If we didn't do anything this year, instead of maybe 30, maybe it might be a 35 or 40, the next time to bring it up to, to uh, par. And that's, that's where you almost got to grab the bull by the horns at some point and say, all right, we've got to take care of this now. And then every year, make sure that we put some increase, whatever it may be, to ensure that we can you know, keep this functioning. Because when you look at it, like I said, this is our one resource that we have to have. There's no question about that. Okay, and, and nothing. I'm not. I, this might be for uh, Mr. Creedon. Mr. Creedon, if you don't mind. Um, with the new or the boom of housing developments yes. in the city and downtown in particular, and, and you know some probably proposed right. later on. Does this proposed does this proposed increase cover that use as well, or is it kind of like a everybody jumps so that we'll be in the same position? Well, every, everybody would jump, but with increased water usage, we're now in our budget, we do have usage of our aquaria, hopefully uh, for in a greater sense than we have of the past. Would we get more revenues? Yes, and that would, but it would affect all of these people in the same way. Whatever rate, the 15% is looking at what is our real capital, what is our real revenue need. However, as Councilor Monaghan was speaking of, one that has a four, uh, Mr. Condon, four year, would, would be spread out, but it would affect, our, our, rev, our rate is not very high at all. One mm -hmm. of the things they try, Mr. Mr. Murphy tried to get across was, our rate is not high compared to other cities and towns mm -hmm. around here. Our rate is uh, for our water is especially low. And uh, so a rate increase in our water would be shared among all the, the new apartment uh, dwellers, which there is a sizable uh, increase. It should be coming this year. Right. We've already had some, and more is increasing now. Our, and I just saw a story of how our, how our rents are, are low. Well, our water rates are low also. And they will be able to supply them, but again, that, that's going to cost us money. Okay. Because it goes to our variable charge. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we need we need some rate increase. Okay. okay. And I actually had a question for Mr. Murphy. I didn't. Is he still here? Oh, here. oh yeah. hello. Um, just for clarification, on slide number oh gee. Uh, I don't know the MWRA 2014 rate survey. What's that first city with the highest rate? I can't really see it on my sheet. 
It's um one two. Lemonster. Nine ten. Oh, is it lemon? That's what it looks like. Lemonster. I think it's number eleven. Oh. It looks like it says California. Uh, California. Oh, Gloucester. Okay. Okay, is Quincy on here? Yeah, MWRA. Where is it? Yes, Brian. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I think I think it would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You said, yes, Council, thank you, Mr. President. Council, Council Dubois. Thank you, Mr. Inieri, um, Chairman Inieri. All right, so I can tell you that I was my first year when the 60% increase was voted in, and I voted for it because you guys came before us and said uh, much of what you're saying tonight, we have to do it, we'll be responsible, we'll do this, we'll do that. And over the next eight years, I saw the city and the DPW and the Water Commission disrespect multiple residents and give them $100,000 water bills and tell them to shut up and pay it and make them put it on their property tax and put their home in jeopardy. And I had to guide more than 30 people to the, to the um, State Appellate Tax Board so they could save their home over stupid water rates that were ridiculous. And in the end, um, almost every single person got their water bill brought down after years of heartache to the bill they thought they owed in the first place. And then I went through a time when the Water Commission more or less blamed the residents and forced them to change out their meters and made these draconian laws about if you don't let us in, we're going to turn your water off and all these other things. And also during that time, I've been promised by two different mayors that Tina Ave would be done. And now it's, it, it's, it's like it's almost like the poor little stepchild of this whole department because it's been promised for five years and every time it's going to be done, it's going to be done and as soon as you get, it never gets done. And there have been four, three or four times that the pipes have been brought up to Tina Ave and put on people's lawns. They've had to mow around them. They've had to weed whack around them. The, the pipes have never been installed. And okay, so they're all mad at me, that's, that's fine. But really, I've been promised that this road has been gonna be done for more than eight years now. So I'm sitting here and you have it up there again, your, your little poster child, and it never gets done. So what is gonna be different today? Because it's, it seems to me that Ward 6 is only being treated worse because this is the first time in my whole time of being a <coughs> city councilor in 10 years that not one street in Ward 6 was done. Not one. So how is this going to change anything? Let me, let me speak to one part of it. You're confusing the <laughs> Department of Public Works with the Water Department. Two different things. People came to appeal. Bob Ford came to you um, to appeal his bill and you told him he owed it. And in the end, it got fixed. So this happened in your commission. Yes, it did. And because of you and what you did and what you brought to everybody's attention, that has been corrected. That's done. And the water meetings that were put in electronically, working like a cell phone so you didn't have to go out and read them, et cetera, was put in place so that now you can get that reading immediately. And within the next eight months or so, because in the process right now, individuals, each one of us can go on the system and see exactly what our water bills are any time, day and night. That's something that's, that's coming in place. That's one thing. <laughs> Without an appropriation, we can't do the things you're talking about. I'm it's not talking simple. about You're talking about them. Is Tina Ave on the list? It is. It's number one on the list. Is it number one on the list? Who makes that decision? The administrative consent order in this particular case. And I thought the administrative consent order was not for Tina Ave. What? It's sorry. Tory. That's Tory. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Then that's no. It's number two. I'm sorry. It's number two. How, so how much is how much is Tory going to cost? Uh, so if Tory's going to cost three and a half million, and this rate increase in the best is going to bring in four million, so Tina Ave isn't getting done. So again, it's like a stepchild up there. We we come out, we show it on display, and then we just the people that have to bathe their kids in brown water. Too bad for us in Ward Six. Go ahead, Jan. 
the Tory Street and Tina Ave will be funded through debt service, through the SRF State Revolving Fund. We've been approved for those grants. Those projects will be done. Tina Ave has been in the Water Commission budget for the last two years, but they've been struck by those above us. So at what why do you do you need a rent a rate increase to get this loan? I mean, wh why are they connected? No, but we need rate increases to rebuild a, a department that's been emaciated. So why haven't why haven't you taken out the the loan prior to this to get these roads done? They you put in for them, you get approved by the state. They look at uh, what they consider. They have their own priority, and we weren't high enough on the list at that point. Okay. So. How many people have taken advantage of the city's um, outside water metering? To my knowledge, none so far. Anybody? Anybody know? Could you please tell us who 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 the applications were were from? I don't. I don't. Individual <laughs> homeowners. I think we could give you that. Privately, I don't think you want to go up there. No, no, I don't want their here. names. But if you could, what I'm interested in, if there have been only two, I'd like, I'd like to just confirm that. And if there have been more than more of them, I would like to know about that as well. Okay. At some point, Councilor, that has nothing to do with it. But at some point, the application will be put on the city webpage, and anybody who's interested would take fill out the application, submit it. So it would be open to any homeowner the only reason it makes any difference is that it's revenue that we're giving away because we're we're charging they're not, we're not charging them for sewer and the sewer rate runs off the water rate and that's all i'm saying is that we're giving certain people advantages already and it's probably going to be um the condo complexes but that's down the road for a different different day how many new people are you going to hire if this rate increase goes through at this point what are we looking for i think it's three Two, so, and a, two and a half persons, so really three. So you're gonna you're gonna redo four million dollars worth of road, and you're gonna hire three new people with the revenue from which which would give us two full. How is that crews, possible? Two full crews we would have at that time. We have one in a piece of a crew. I think <laughs> I would like to like talk. I'm wondering if we could postpone this so we can bring the commissioner of the DPW here because I just want to get my head around what's really going to happen because if I because I've heard a couple numbers thrown around tonight one being a four-year layout of the increase which would bring in a little bit more than four million dollars but the cost of these projects are four million dollars but we're going to be paying a debt service on them I would just like to know how you're going to not outsource all the work on the roads can someone explain that to me because from what I understand we have I'm looking at the I'm looking at the budget here we have quite a few people in the in the water department are they not are they not working or, or what are they doing why can't they redo the roads why do we have to outsource and, and hire private contractors to do it the people that we do have on staff and and i don't know if brian could speak better to this but they are busy it's one crew that goes around addressing every every leak every every hydrant every every issue that comes up um the larger projects the tina ave the tory street those will be contracted out okay that's, that's my belief right brian with the the srf funding yeah. those will be contracted yeah. out the longer it takes to implement the rate increases over time the longer it will take us to assess how much we have to re-evaluate re-staff i know that mr riley has the intent of of hiring at least is he looking at one crew brian is he looking to hire three this year if he gets yeah. the increase So if you hired three. And this is all including clerks. Yeah. Uh, there are approximately uh, uh, 43 individuals, and that is down seven from what it was only six years ago in 2008. All right. And revenues didn't increase, and we actually, there we cut the number of personnel. That's when we started TNET and then pipes were on the lawn, and then we had Pipes off the lawn because we didn't have the crew. Brian, can, can you just speak in front of the microphone? Sorry. Yeah, they're having a hard time on the other side hearing you. Yes. So that, that it is the number of individuals. We're, we're down about seven individuals uh, from where we were back in 2008 or 2009. At that point, when the Aquaria budget started to go up, 
our available revenues, and at that point we were doing one and a half, one and a quarter to one and a half miles a year by our own crew. An example of a street done by the city crew is Lyman Street. Right. All right. So but if we hire these three people, we're going to be able to start doing if that. If we again? hired a crew, we could start doing Great. some of that. However, the equipment we have. And, and you know, it's really this is something which would fall under the commissioner, DPW commissioner, to speak more uh, eloquently on. Uh, but it, it was uh, this: the council back in '96 added five people, allowed us to hire five more people. That allowing to fi that five more people added a crew that would, could be dedicated doing road work, right? right? And that's when we started, and we actually replaced about 35 miles, counting what the city crew did and what the outside crews did, right. what the uh, contractors. But then with, in 2008 is when the Aquaria funding came in, and this has obviously affected our budget. Right. Right. And so we have lost manpower since then. So we're just dealing with the ramifications of really bad decisions that have been made in the past. Uh, we, we have the decisions that have been made. The decisions have been made, and <coughs> in fact, we have, we have water where other communities do not. Right. All right. So, and it's, uh, you know, I'm not going to say it's good or bad. I'm not going to get. So in years past, um, when we set the water rates, we would always get a chart that kind of laid out the different um, levels that people used a certain amount of water would have to pay. Yep. And in the past, the city council actually affected a lot of change in those levels of if you use zero to 100 cubic gallons, right. you pay X per cubic gallon. If you use 100 to 200 cubic gallons, you pay X for that, that gallon. Why, why isn't that being presented to us so we can look at it? And why is well, that it, not it, here it, tonight? It, 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 it would if if that is desired, absolutely. That is absolutely I, required, yeah, I would say. Yeah. Well, I think Every other year, we've always seen that, and I've always been able to look at what a single elderly person um, is going to be facing by the rate structure increase. And year upon year, Brian, uh, Mr. Creedon, and I have talked about making sure that that elder that lives by themselves isn't being... Um, harshly burdened by an increase in water rates and we were able to look into that and look at the proposed structure and then when we voted for a rate increase we really knew what we were voting for as of tonight we're going to i mean you're proposing 15 percent or 30 percent over two years but as of tonight i'm not seeing the detail work that we had gotten in the past um I, I would like to see that. I hope that my fellow counselors will um, postpone this so we can actually get it. And I just, one more final comment. Just like <coughs> with the water rates, and everyone is concerned about the businesses that use a lot of water. I've talked to many businesses that use a lot of water. I've had many conversations with Churchill Linens about their water bill. And though I'm sure they wish it was lower, it was the errors in their water bill that really made them upset because they were actually being misbilled just like many other um, regular people, like the poor single mother that got the $100,000 water bill that she was told to be quiet and pay for three years, and her reputation was drawn through the mud by people in the city hall, which was... Un, 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 unexcusable. Council, that's on a different issue. It is, but it, it goes issue. to the point of if I want to, if anybody at home wants to pay more money for water and just trust that they're going to be billed correctly. And then, and just in final, just finally, for years and years, when we talk about tax increase, we have many businesses come in and they say, don't raise my taxes, raise the homeowner's taxes. And I've been an adamant, adamant ardent supporter of keeping single-family homeowner bills low. And I fought for it every year, that percentage I've always fought for. And as a result, Brockton has, not just of my efforts, of this council's efforts, Brockton has the second lowest single family, second lowest homeowner property tax bill in all of southeastern Massachusetts. That isn't a one-year deal. That has been built over multiple years. So then the Dukakis um, Institute did a study. It was recently released, and it looked at do businesses not go to municipalities that have high commercial tax rates. And you know what the Dukakis Institute found? They go to they go to places that have high tax rates. That is not what keeps businesses away. It's the Dukakis Institute through the through the business 
Association that this, this was done. So to say if the commercial rate goes up that somehow we're going to inhibit business, I think is just wrong headed. It's easy to say, but I don't think that's necessarily true. They use more water. They're the reason that we got the desal plant. They're the reason that we have all the pipes and the infrastructure that we need. There's no reason that a lawyer or any economist couldn't sit down and say, if you're a big rate user, you are the reason that we have the huge system that we have, and therefore you should be paying more. The idea that we should be subsidizing these businesses in their water use is ridiculous. And I'm dealing with that with the NIP permit I'm dealing with everything there's only so much corporate welfare when you have the people that are paying taxes they can't even buy their kids groceries and shoes for school so I want to focus on the single-family homeowner and the working families in this city and if it's to the detriment of a huge it isn't even to the detriment I'm just asking for you to be fair there's no right, reason counsel. that we That's should be enough. coddling there's right. no reason that we should let's, be let's get back on let's get back on the track that's before us right no now. There is no reason that we should be coddling businesses. We're on order number twelve. Are, are you counselor. censoring me or something? Because does that go to a vote? I don't know what's happening here. I'm just telling you. Let's get back to what we're talking I'm, about. We are talking about a rate increase. Are you going increase. off on track on something we're else, counselor? We're talking about a rate increase. I, I don't understand. Five minute recess. Great. Right. I will recognize Councilor Dubois. She had the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in closing, I'm not going to vote for any increase that provides corporate welfare. So if you want to help people that are in poverty, eh, I love that. If you want to help low-income workers, I love that. If you want to help the single person, living, an elder living on their own, I totally support that. But the idea that middle-income, single-family homeowners should be picking up the tab for corporations is something I won't support. <coughs> Could I support a, proper, a water rate increase? Sure. But I'm definitely not going to support anything that puts the cost of um, somebody's business on a single family home. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Dubois. Council Stewart, you had. Thank you, Mr. Debate. Chairperson. Um, so, in, in general, I'm in favor of the increase. I think it's it's needed and over overdue, and I think we're constantly getting to the situation where we're forced to ask for these huge increases because, unfortunately, this body can't vote for gradual increases, which is what we all think believe needs to be done. Um, I, I think in the past I would have had similar hesitations because I didn't have much confidence in the leadership of the department, which is no secret, but I am um, encouraged by what we're seeing with the new leadership um, and the, the approach to the work and the respect for residents and that huge transition I think we've all recognized as city councilors about uh, how the DPW has been run. So I have a lot more confidence that the right leadership is in place that then builds confidence that whatever recommendations you guys are making are you know, legitimate recommendations because our role isn't to micromanage necessarily what uh, the departments do. Uh, so the last increase was when again? In 2008. So there's been no increase uh, in the sewer rate since 2008. No, sewer is separate. I mean water. This is just water. Sorry, sorry, my, my, the water rate and, in and If I may, again, the Water Commission is only the water department. The sewer falls under the commissioner, the DPW, which is also streets and a whole bunch of other things that, again, water is only water, period. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, okay. I, I definitely understood that. Thank and you. Just <coughs> um, 
And so we're, we're voting solely on this request for a 15% increase uh, over the next twice, a 30% increase over the next two years. And these other recommendations in the PowerPoint presentation are simply recommendations to be instituted when and how. Again, as, as soon as possible. This would include those in most cases. Uh, so if, uh, where, where possible. So the recommendations in the, power, in the PowerPoint presentation, you're saying, I just want to be clear what, what we're voting Is on. Is there something exactly that you're asking about? Well, there's a slide here that says recommendations in the, in the PowerPoint presentation. What page is that, please? On the first page. It's Very first page. It, I don't have. It's the first it's, page. It's, well, it's sheet number nine. The oh. PowerPoints don't have slide numbers. So. Yeah, that's, that's, that's all to be included in the budget. The, you're talking the bottom slide on page nine. Right. Yeah, that's to be included within, within this increase. If you did the 30%, which would be 15 each year, and by the way, that 1,000 elderly persons would probably be $2 a month, a little over $2 a month uh, per person. Okay, right. or per family, whichever. Okay. And so to reiterate, the reason that you're asking for what seems to be fairly massive increases is because we're not increasing the amount on a yearly basis because this body right. rejects those requests for those uh, more casual increases year by year. Correct. And, and by doing that, we're following back because, right. we, again, we have two, which was pointed out, we have two, um, I'll call them bonds for lack of term, which they are in depth in the, in the other piece. Um, that have to be paid. So a, a, I think it's 25% of our budget is going towards that. So we lose a portion of the budget just for that. Now, the more we take out, which might help to get where we want to be, we're just pushing ourselves backwards. <coughs> we're putting those in the future having to pay for something that we could pay for now with this crease, increase. And like I said, if we don't do it now, right. then next year it'd be something higher. And the further off we put it, to catch up, to do the true catch up, it's got to increase to do that. I mean, right. it's simple mathematics. It's it becomes, no, and it no becomes more, it seems to me it would become more expensive because if we're not investing in the repairs that need to be done and we delay on those repairs, the cost escalate. I do have a question about, uh, a couple of things. So, and, and I appreciate you're adding the slide in terms of the percentage of, of the household income that's paid to cover the, the water rates. So it's um, page number six. Again, I'm not certain what the slide number is. So of the top 10 cities in Massachusetts and the percentage of the income paid to cover water rates, of the top 10, there are only two other cities. There are only two cities that are that pay a higher percentage than we do in Brockton. So I'm just trying to under, understand what that means exactly. So is that uh, an indication of the level of poverty in the city? So even though you're saying our rates are competitive, we, we only have two other cities that are, that are paying a higher percentage. I think what it, what, in essence what it says, it talked about the household medium income. So I guess you could answer that in saying, yeah, the, the poverty is involved in that. But we are, what, number three, I think it was? As well, we're, we're at... No, we're less than that, actually. The three, uh, the three I see Boston and um, Quincy. And Lynn. Oh, and Lynn, okay. Yeah, Lynn is in there. Fall River's 84. And we're 90. Springfield. Okay, and so I guess my... So, for example, with... Cambridge at 0.53 percent, correct? Correct. So is that? I'm trying to understand if these if this represents that Cambridge has a more efficient system, or is it that on, the income in Cambridge is so high, and that's why we're seeing the disparity I in these percentages? I think it's two things. They're on MWRA, which is a, you know totally different system, um, and and their income is higher. I think we know that. There's no question on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's going to make a difference. That makes a big difference. And, and you, you indicated that the increase in, in the amount of this 30% over two years, um, we would still be at 0.9%. Correct. Um, so we're not seeing a difference in the, the percentage of people's income having to go into covering the water rates, correct? Correct. Uh, and I'm assuming that this idea of staging it over two years 
we could stage it over, I, I think it was discussed a little bit earlier, we could stage it over m multiple years, correct? We could. The problem, again, is we're trying to get to a point of zero and then move up from there. And the longer we s don't do that, the further back. It's like taking one step forward and two back at the same time. And that's, that's really what that was about. That's all that that's about. Okay, very helpful. You could, you could string it out, but again, um, we want to be in a position that we don't have any major problems that we've seen other cities in this Commonwealth have. So right, and we've been more than lucky at this point. Well, I think there are two deciding factors for me. Clearly that uh, we all are um, struggling with the fact that you're asking for, for such large increases, but we understand uh, if we were um, um, being genuine in our concern is that th this body hasn't approved more modest increases over time. So that's partly our creation of why we're here today. Um, and then the second issue for me would be uh, having a lot more confidence in the leadership of DPW and feeling more confident that uh, the requests from the department are coming at us with um, a lot more integrity and due diligence than I had confidence was happening in the past. And again, our role isn't to micromanage departments, but but once there's, in my view, once there's confidence in the leadership in that department, you uh, want to defer to that expertise at that department. So those are sort of the two reasons why I feel like I, I will support um, some type of increase. I tend to think that 30% over three years would be more feasible, you know, than 30% over two years. But um, I think it's certainly at our disadvantage not to, to fund this request as, as indicated. So thank you very much, very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Council Cruz, then Council Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, Jay, if, if you could first, I mean, first of all, I've talked about this for years. We need to do this, you know, we can't wait seven years all the time to do this. That's why these large requests come in. Yes. The expense reimbursement, what was it, two years ago, we, we were $2 million shortfall or? I think it's about a million six, yes. So I see the expense reimbursement in the 2016 budget is for $2,361,000. Yeah, that's based on, let me move this, sorry about yep. the noise. That's based on last year's budget. Uh, my office is calculating what it would be this year. It should be very, very close. If you remember, that expense reimbursement comprises mainly health insurance cost and dental cost for water employees because the money is being budgeted in the general fund. Second, it includes pension cost, same thing, it's in general fund, not a water budget. There's a little bit of debt service that was issued under a special act that has to be in the general fund that reimburses for the water portion of that debt. And then there is a charge for services provided by general fund offices like law, accounting, treasury. It's done on a percentage of buzz, uh, budget basis. All of those costs are what's in that. But that money was actually taken out of the general fund. It, was, it was reduced. Re there, was a, there was a reimbursement made. I think the reimbursement was about two million or so and about Instead a million. Of and a million six wasn't paid. They just couldn't do it. So the general fund pay. lost that revenue. So the general fund, the taxpayers of Brockton, not the ratepayers of the water system, ate that money. Correct. That's correct. Because I think we lose sight sometimes of that approximately. And I, uh, you started to give a count before. Uh, Brian probably knows this. How many ratepayers are not in the city, are not taxpayers to the city of Brockton? Uh, they're right. They're right. <coughs> 22,000 in the city, and then outside of the city, there is, Whit I can't say, the entire town of Whitman. Uh, but fairly substantial. Health. I'm not asking for yeah. an exact number, but a fairly substantial amount of people that we're talking about raising the rates on are not taxpayers of Brockton, correct? Yeah. Jay, I, yeah, I mean, are, so yeah. when we eat that money, the taxpayers of Brockton ate that money, but the ratepayers of this water system as a whole did not. Am I correct? Right. Correct. Correct. Okay. And th that alone drives me crazy. So we have actually cost the taxpayers of Brockton by, <coughs> by our refusal to consistently stay a abreast of where we should be. Mm -hmm. We're costing the taxpayers of Brockton money Correct. that then can't be used either yeah. as part of the two and a half full override or depending on how the budget is made in a particular year is money that can't be spent on, on the things that we looked to <coughs> to provide to, to the taxpayers of Brockton. So over a million dollars was just thrown away because under the, how the, uh, not thrown away, but the rate payers did not pay. Correct. 
So those people of Whitman and Abington and those other places got a free ride for a million dollars worth of the... Uh, for their share. Yeah. For that year. Yeah, yeah. And if we were not to do anything, that could easily be happening on a more con consistent basis, Jake, it correct? It happened in this year's budget yeah. again. It didn't happen last right. year because we just didn't let it happen. You know, we did it for one year, and I thought, we'll get a rate through to fix it. We didn't get a rate through, but we cut the budget even more for the water services side, so that wouldn't happen last year. But, you know, we're kind of up against where we can make reductions and still provide services to the citizens from their crews. That's, that's the problem. Okay. Thank you on that. And then I, I heard one of my colleagues say we should have voted to go to the MWRA years ago. But if I'm reading your slide here, and I guess, Ozzy, you can answer this, even with the $7 million that we're paying to Aquaria this year, we still are substantially below the MWRA median usage, correct? That's correct. So if we had gone to that years ago, we'd be paying X amount even higher than we, we're paying now. That's correct. We, we would have paid all that MWRA money, um, and, and so, so all these years, every ratepayer we have would have been paying quite a bit more money than we've paid for these last. That's correct. Um, so even with the seven million in there, um, we mm -hmm. we are still substantially below the MWRA rate. That's correct. May I remind too, if we didn't have a queer as the consent order required us to have a second system. If we lost that for any reason, we still have to have a second system. A second system. Which uh, we don't have if, if that disappears. And of course, that consent decree came because some of the towns down around Silver Lake pushed the state to force us to have a second. Um, uh, not because of... I don't have that answer. Uh, it, it, yeah, it was I believe it time. came from the state, but I don't know if that was the reason. I don't yeah. have that and then just, and, and this is more philosophical, and I, with all due respect to uh, Council Dubois, I think that we look at the businesses, they're actually subsidizing the lower end users because as they move up in the block, they're paying more per gallon than the lower person is. And I do want to make sure we don't, we don't hurt those low end users, but they, those businesses are actually subsidizing the use of the system. Uh, and again, some of that is just philosophical and whether you want to or not, uh, but that's really what the, the case is. Whether they should or shouldn't, that's up to each one of us to decide. But, uh, and I mean, I can see that we're probably not going to do anything on this tonight, but I think we need to put a fairly substantial rate in, but I want to stretch it out over a number of years. And in fact, if we can, and I'm going to have to check with Mr. Gilday on this, put it in for a longer period of time with some smaller rate increases after we've done the early rate increases because clearly it's a difficult vote for a city council to make and every year you guys come in under the ordinance you come in and make a recommendation and there's never a stomach for doing it till we get to the emergency situations. We need to get to where this is a, a built-in minor increase maybe attached to the uh, uh, the uh, federal rates, uh, uh, inflation or whatever, I don't know, because I don't like the idea of just saying we're going to go up 3% every year because theoretically costs could go down. Uh, you know, we know that doesn't happen very often, but, uh, you know, even those businesses, and I've talked to some that, you know, say, oh, we're paying a lot for water. I remind them, well, you're paying the same amount for water that you paid seven years ago, and there aren't many things in their businesses, as somebody in business, there aren't many times that we're paying the same thing we were seven years ago, so even those businesses need to be put on notice that we have to pay for this. These, these pipes are falling apart, so we need to do this, and I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Kruger. <laughs> Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to first of all thank uh, Commissioners uh, Mr. Jordan and Mr. Murphy, and just uh, this might have been your first introduction to Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy was one of the Council's appointment, and I, I want to thank you for your uh, presentation tonight. Uh, councilors, I think we have to <coughs> remember that the city of Brockton is a business and there is a cost to doing business. Um, as a homeowner in the city of Brockton, I mean, there's a lot of expenses of upkeep and, and maintenance when you have an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, a uh, mason come in. You don't want to do it, but you need to do it. And the uh, city of Brockton needs to have some type of influx of cash. I don't think 30% 30, 30 is going to be the appropriate. I, I do like what Mr. Conan mentioned relative to... Uh, doing a staggered approach. I'd like to see that. I'm going to make a motion tonight to postpone this. I'd like to see those, those figures so we can kind of look at that and, and vet it out a bit. I think protecting the seniors is something this council has done as long as I've been on, and I think we need to continue to do that. I also think we need to bear in mind exactly what Mr. Cruz just said about uh, 
the, the higher rate uh, block. Um, I, Mr. Conner, I had one question for you. Relative to going to the open market, the interest rates are so great right now, so low. What would be your thought to bond it out so that we could get the Tory Street project going? Well, I think we absolutely should. Uh, without a question, is I the think ball, the Tina Abbott ball project ought to be subject. Uh, that that project has been long delayed. It ought to be undertaken. The Tory Street we have to undertake because it's a consent decree. My recommendation: we need the revenues because I don't want to issue a, a, a bond and have the general fund being required to pay it. We've got problems on that side of the budget too. This is a, a revenue problem that can be addressed with an action by the city council. So if you do, I would suggest that we bond out. Those two major capital projects. I think there was another one in there Tina. as well that could be. Tina, we could yes. be number one. Yes, number two yes. Of them. we bond all of those out. Get the uh, get the money in, do the project, and pay it off over 20 years because it's going to have much more than 20 years of useful life. That, that's my recommendation. Yeah, I mean, and the right now are very favorable. If you amortize it over 20 years, it's I mean it's going to be minuscule in terms of. And we can squeeze it into the budget, okay. but we do need a rate increase to do that. And so what uh, I would suggest, Councillor, is I can provide by email the spreadsheet that I showed Councillor Monahan to all of you, and it's just a bunch of spreadsheet cells. Whatever you want to do, Councillor Dubois has some suggestions, Councillor Cruz has some suggestions. It needs a city council action, so it takes a consensus by this body. If we do something which gets all the votes, you know, it might be more on this end, less on that end. That's up to you folks, but I can give you at least a starting point. And I don't have any pride of authorship in it. I just tried to get a million bucks a year, and let's see what happens. We, we will play with it to get it so that we can get six votes and get it through. Thank you, Mr. Conn. Councilors, I'm going to make a motion to postpone this uh, until the uh, uh, the first first FENCOM uh, in May. Second. Second. Motion's been <coughs> made and seconded. On the motion? Uh, on the motion, first off, Councilor Rodriguez before you, Councilor DiNapoli. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, I just wanted to say uh, something to uh, the commissioner. Uh, I, I think this is my second year in this council, and I believe this is the second time that you folks are coming to this body looking for a 30% increase. I think one of the issues that a lot of us face as uh, taxpayers, ratepayers in this community is that if you actually came to this body with a 10% increase or 5% increase over two or three years, believe it or not, you would have the amount of money you're looking for to do the, some of the projects that you're doing. I think one of the issues is that once the Water Commission has actually come here to make a presentation, they're asking for a 30% increase over two years, three years, or whatever it might be. I think that alone just kind of scares the daylights out of everybody, including myself as a as a rate bear. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think we, uh, this body has shied away from providing you with the funds that you need. But I, I have a quick question. I don't know exactly who can answer this for me. Um, do we have any idea what the leakage on those pipes actually are costing us in terms of water? It's a uh, leakage now. It's, it's I'm talking about on the, on the three major projects that we were talking about. Oh, leak! I don't believe there's a leakage on it. It's a case of actually replacing those pipes because so of the not, condition they're in. You know, we're not losing any water from those from those pipes. If, if it is, it's insignificant. It's insignificant. Um, also, uh, I've noticed on the presentation that you've made um, the uh, the Aquaria uh, payment. <coughs> I, I believe last year was somewhere around six point three million dollars that it was actually budgeted. Can somebody explain to me why all of a sudden in a year this payment is actually increasing by a whole million dollars? That's the variable uh, rate that, that, you know, the use of it that we've had. One of the things we were doing, uh, the end of the summer, to make to this deals with environmental things and other things that we also deal with, uh, dealing with Silver Lake, we do try to use water from Aquaria, i.e. not having, using less water from Silver Lake, not only to help us, but to help those other towns in that area. Um, that, that allows us to, again, be conservative on that. And it also has to do with fish and fish getting back into the stream, et cetera. It's all part of what goes on <coughs> with this. But 
We've asked Evie and I think for additional money for this year for two reasons. One, there was one of the towns that wanted to, for a couple of months, do some work, and they asked us could they use the system, and we didn't have a problem with that. We just wanted to make sure they asked enough of the right money so that up front we could say yes, and they would pay us, you know, once that, that happens. But I think they said a month or two, and as most of us know, most projects end up going two or three or four months. So we asked them to give us the best price they could. That's one thing. And the other is, again, to be conservative of using the water in the Silver Lake. We're part of the um, watershed that deals with the Jones River. So with that, you know, we've been asked, and we now have members on that commission that we haven't had in a number of years to do some things that we haven't been doing. They've been asking us for years to do certain things. One other thing's going to happen. They're going to ask us at some point through us to you to put up some money for certain things they like to see done in that area. But that's a different time, a different issue. But all this is, is, is what you have say in, and all we do is recommend to you what, this, you know, what these particular things are. Well, the reason I'm asking is because you're utilizing the numbers for Aquaria to make your case that you need a $20 million budget. And if that number is not a, a concrete number or a number that actually is around that particular uh, need, it does affect what you're asking for in terms of rate increase. That's the reason why I'm bringing that up. Because if you're saying you need an, an extra million dollars in rate increase to make your budget, and yet you don't need as much to pay your obligations to Aquaria, I'm saying that number would decrease where, I mean, basically from what I understand from a lot of the counselors in the, on this body, they were willing to support some sort of an increase, perhaps not at 15 to 30 percent, but at least that, that, that asking would be a lot less than what you're asking for. That's the reason why I'm bringing that up. There's a fixed cost for Aquaria. Oh, I know that, because we've been dealing with Aquaria for quite some time. We decide, we being all of us, what we will allow to be you to use during the year. One of the indeterminate pieces is, like I mentioned, depending how much water we get between now and the end of the summer, <coughs> will determine how much water we will take or try not to take, actually, from Silver Lake, which helps all the way around. Doesn't sound like it does, but it does. Um, that's a, that's a, something we can't determine because we don't know how much rain we're going to get. Um, we thought from the snow we'd get a lot more than what we get, you know, had in the melting. We are at totals right now, but if we don't get rain the rest of the summer, like last summer, we were almost down to the, the bare minimum. <coughs> at one point, we did go below. That's when we ask for more water from Aquaria than we do try to pull out of our other systems. So what you're saying, you're actually going to ask Aquaria to provide the city with a million dollars worth of water, basically. Yes. Not, not the city. Asking, we're asking Aquaria. To provide. We, yeah, and, and we have to have that money available to be able to spend it. We're not so, looking just to spend it. We're not, it's like an up to kind I of thing. I understand okay. that. I understand that. What I'm, what I'm saying to you is that in reality, you don't need $7.3 million. Budgeting, we do. Yeah, but you're asking us to approve a rate based on these numbers to satisfy your budget. Correct. When in reality, you probably don't need the entire $7.3 million because you don't know that yet. We don't know it, but we're going on the history we've had the last few years. It's not a number we just pick out of any place. And as somebody mentioned up there, you have to run it like a business to a point. Okay, It, it is public funds, and I understand that, but you still have to use some um, concepts of, of what business is all about. And business costs. Everything costs. I understand that. Okay. Mr. Jordan, I, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but I do live in this community, and I live in the same community than you do, you know, so your costs are my costs. Exactly. And when I, when I last checked, uh, 234 Summer Street pays water bills and tax bills like everybody else, if not a little, a little higher than most. But I'm just saying that, to me, I'm going to go home and basically when the, the rate payers or the taxpayers ask, why are you increasing my water bill? that I would be able to say, look, we, we have to increase it because we need $20 million. All right, may I, may I also give you a possible approach 
for seven years, there's been no increase. I get that. So if you divide that back through, and you would have had X amount of increases, so you're making up for that too. That's part of what but, they may not understand. But you can't make it in one year. That's what my, the, the whole basis. I'm trying basis, to make it in one year, sir. The whole big, you make, you're trying to make it in two years. All I'm saying is that the reason why we're running into these issues is that because <coughs> we come to this body asking for 30%. And 30% scares the daylights out of just about anybody that can actually, that's actually watching us or it lives in this community. What I'm saying to you is that if you increased in small increments, it doesn't have to be 15%. It could be 5%. It could be 10%. It could be whatever small amount or small percentage. It's easier to swallow than 30%. It's, it's easier to swallow, but at the same time, we're also going backwards because not having that additional money is still going to cost us. But you're running the risk of getting nothing. That's what I'm, last and year, last year you got nothing. True. And that's what I'm saying. You're running the risk again of getting nothing. Where in fact, if we had asked for 10% last year, it would have been 10%. Last year was 65 No, you got nothing. It was 65 last year. That's what the percentage was. Okay. Yeah. And but that wasn't uh, approved. Okay. No, you didn't. You got nothing. Right. Okay. What I'm saying is that you got nothing last year and you're running the risk of getting nothing this year because of these high percentages. I'm I, saying I, I think you need to settle in small percentages. You know, pick the small victories in the sense because I think it's easier to swallow than 30%. And I do, I, I agree with what Mr. Condon presented to us tonight, to be honest with you, because I think you spread that out and you make the numbers a lot smaller. It makes a lot more sense. I mean, we understand that we've got you know, $6 million worth of repairs to do. We've got the, the, that monstrosity in Dighton to pay for. Right. We understand that. But the point is that it's a, it's a lot easier for the, for the rate players to swallow if those numbers are not as inflated as it is in terms of percentages. You know, if the percentage was smaller, it's easier to take. We could do that. And that's something that, yes, we could do. As long as you understand, we may have to come back and ask for some high number for an outside company to come in and do the repairs. You might get nothing again. If we get nothing, we'll have no water. There you go. <laughs> so, I mean, that, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's, and I'm not trying to joust with you. That's not it at all. Okay. I'm just trying to present a position. And I understand where you're coming from on all that. But again, like I said earlier, one step forward, two backwards. You can't do that. You wouldn't do it with your home, as you mentioned. You know, you can't let your front stairs or porch <coughs> keep going back, back, back. You say, well, we'll do it next year, next year. Keep using the back door or the side door because one day somebody's going to walk on that porch and you're going to have to pay a suit or something. But I so it's, I'm just using that as an example of what we keep doing in this situation. And I'm not saying that it has to be the 30%. I'm not saying that. It could be the 30% strung out in a longer period. But it still needs to be caught up at some point as soon as possible. Because you're going to have, we've got a few trucks right now. I said right now, I don't think anybody in this room would get in them to, to drive them. And that's the truth. The headlines tomorrow in the paper would be the council approved a 30% rate increase for, for the water rates. That's what it would be like. And what I'm saying to you is that it would be a lot easier to say the council approved a 10% rate increase right, if council, you came in and you asked for 10%. That's what I'm saying. I, Mr. I think, Chairman, go I, ahead. I think the point's well taken. We're just spinning a wheel to be Truthful with you. We're spinning a wheel. Councillor Denapoli, one more, one, one more comment. One more time. Thank on you, the Mr. Motion. Chairman. On the motion. I have a question for. Uh, um, okay, Mr. Jordan, why don't you put Thank your you. hat on and Sullivan. run? I'll run this by you. The MWRA. How many communities do they service? Because you're comparing the MWRA with Brockton. I do not off, know off the top of my head, but I could find that out. Do they, do they have rates like we do where they have a, a lower rate for people who only use a little yes. water? Or yes. do they have one rate? Yes. They have multiple rates. Yes. Okay. Do other communities have water uh, repair trucks like Brockton does for the repair in the roads? Or does the MWRA take care of that? No, they provide... Do the cities get they a provide the water, which comes to the city itself. And the city, in turn, then puts it through their system. Okay, let's let's use Weymouth for an example. Okay, they have their own trucks, like we have our own correct water division, right? Do they? How are they, how are they paid? 
Do they have that a... Would be the town of Weymouth would be dealing with that. The town of Weymouth does, right. just like Brockton. Right. Does the MWRA now, kick back and replace the pipes in the, in, in the, in the uh, streets? They may do the transmission pipes, the large pipes coming down from the western part of the state. They may, we don't but know not, that, though. But, well, they do do that. They, they, they do take do care that. of that. But they don't take care of once it enters, um, say, the, the town of Weymouth or if it was Brockton, the city of Brockton, then we, it would be under us at that point. Okay. The other, qu the other question I have is the uh, AWWA industrial standard usage, what, where'd you get that? American Water Works Association. Is, is that across country? That's, yeah, the state, that's the National Organization of Water Works. Okay. Because okay. yeah, this, is, this, is this is where you, we're, we're comparing uh, apples to oranges in my, my well, book with the numbers. The, the AWWA establishes standards that we have for all many of our things in the water industry, size of pipes, delivery of pressure and whatever. So they're a, the board that set the standards. It's a, an engineering-based group, okay? Uh, so it's for the cold country, yes. Okay. So right. I just, I it was just, just a standard. That's a standard that was used for the MWA survey, which is a, a community that they supply water and sewer. In the case of Weymouth, they don't supply water. They supply sewer to Weymouth, all right? Okay, because you, you have here that the <coughs> aver an average cost of water if, with the MWRA is $1,400 a year. Is that, is that what you got down here? That's for? the survey that has that, yes. A survey. And now you're using Brockton as $889, yep. a survey. Yep. Was this company that was hired to take this survey? They, yes. Were, they they the made up these numbers? The and Bond is hired every year by the MWRA to do this survey, and the city of Brockton participates, but it does not get charged. We don't charge, they just ask us questions. So that I, as I said, I've sent it to all of you for the last two years, but I'll send it again just so you could review it. And uh, if it coming up in the May, <coughs> if it's postponed to May, that way you'll have a chance to actually Because <coughs> Councilor Cruz and I are debating on these numbers, and I just, uh, personally, I don't believe these numbers. Okay. But that's, that's my opinion. Okay. But okay. okay. Well, well, on, on that note, I thank you, gentlemen. We're going to, uh, I guess we're going to move a question. Motion, motion's been made and seconded that we postpone this item until the first finance meeting in May, which would be May 4th. All in favor of that? Hands up high. All opposed? Yeah, get them up. That, has been, that item has been postponed to the first FinCom in May the 4th. Uh, uh, our Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Condon, you're going to get us information. And I also want hard copies as well. <coughs> okay. Chairman, in addition to that, could we also request Council Dubois had, had made a really uh, wise uh, statement that in years past we did get something from the Commission, a spreadsheet breakdown. I'd like to see that as well. Exactly. And we do, and we do, want, and we do want that information as, as, uh, Thank you. as you well. Want the, and you want the block rate also from us. Exactly. Just the way that it used to be before, I will, I will publicly state I was not happy with this presentation myself, and I concur with some of the comments some of my counselors made. And I've been here for 12 years. Let's get on the right page here. Mr. I, Chairman, I regarding that, could, they, could I request that they email the presentation to us so we can read it a little better? Exactly. Thank you. Okay. All right, we're all we're set on that particular item. We're done with that. We're done. Madam uh, Counselor Mr. Cruz. Chairman, make a motion to take number 19 out Thank of order. You. Thank Second. you. Second. Second. Motions are made and second that we take uh, item number 19 out of order. Resolved that the mayor, chief of police, chief financial officer, and the city's building superintendent come before finance committee to discuss the position of code enforcement office in conjunction with the police department and provide the committee with an update on when this vital position will be reinstated and operational on a daily basis. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Congen, Chief Financial Officer. And, and my apologies as well because we should have included uh, Chief Crowley. C Chief Crowley is here this evening and he's going to be coming up to, uh, um, to the microphone to um, speak on, be on this um, particular order. I also want to just uh, indicate to all of you counselors, please um, just follow suit to a message that was given to me by the president of the Patrolmen's uh, Association um, Union indicating that there is to be no discussion whatsoever about the person that was in the position before. What he did, how he did it, how well he did it, does not matter. 
the person has indicated and this has come to me that he's indicated he does not want in any such way to be a part of this conversation and the mayor had also received the same message in other words that person has indicated as well he's out of that he likes what he's doing now has no intentions of ever returning to what he did before and he just does not want to be discussed or he will take it to a higher level so we do not want that to happen with that being said um, chairman the, go ahead, Councilor Sullivan. Thank you. As you, as you and I file this resolve, Correct. and I'll make it clear again, I'm not talking about a person, I'm talking about a position, and I'm going to be quick because I know we, we're getting late into the night. And Good evening, Chief. Good evening, Councilor. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, two quick questions, and then I'm done, and then my colleagues. Is the position of code enforcement out of the Brockton PD currently filled and being utilized? Brockton Police is actively doing code enforcement every single day. So yes, it's the, my answer would be yes. Okay, and then this is a question because you weren't chief at the time to the mayor, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Could you could good you evening, again? Counsel. Good evening. Again, we're talking about the position. Nobody else. Um, could you just explain again why it, why it is that the position wasn't filled the day after this this body voted for the overtime funds for Brockton PD? Uh, it, it was clearly the intention of Chief Hayden to uh, fulfill that obligation uh, that he made to you. And uh, subsequent to that, and based upon uh, meetings he subsequently held uh, with uh, offices that work for him, uh, I think that there was changes made that uh, did not, beyond my control certainly, that uh, prevented uh, I think there was an assumption that a person who had been in the position before would just reassume the position. That didn't happen. Uh, I certainly wasn't directly involved in those conversations. Uh, so subsequent to that, with Chief Crowley coming in, I think I, the Chief and I both want to state unequivocally that if anything, we believe in a greater commitment to code enforcement and are willing to commit even more resources to code enforcement. And uh, Council, as you know, uh, I served as an outside code enforcement officer for the city for two years prior to becoming mayor. So I think I've been out on the front lines. I think I have a pretty good insight into um, code enforcement in its entirety, including all the agencies that are involved. And uh, I think that uh, Chief Crowley and uh, his uh, term now as chief has designed what he believes is the best model to ensure that we have active code enforcement every day. And uh, that's an operational decision on his part. I think it's fair for me to share the mission and the vision and, and the commitment that I've made to code enforcement. I think it's operational decisions to the chief, the, the head of the Board of Health, the head of the building department, the fire chief, all the various agencies that are involved in the various aspects of enforcing the code and so on, codes and ordinances of the city uh, to get their job done. And everyone will be judged based upon their performance. And uh, if someone's, if a particular part of code enforcement is not producing, then changes will be made. But I think that uh, Chief Crowley has put together a model that he feels will be very effective, and I think that uh, he has a right to be given some time to show some results with it. And I would even say early on, I can see results already. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilor. Councilor Mar uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Councilor Barnes. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, because you, you were, you know, here and, you know, present for the assertion from former Chief Hayden about uh, what was going to be happening going forward the next day, as uh, Councilor Sullivan has brought up <coughs> a few times, how soon, how soon after that meeting was it determined that this team would take over the duties of the code enforcement instead of um, assigning one particular person or two people or rotating how soon did that happen after the meeting I think that uh, I think it turned out not to be the next day I think it turned out to be a week later because I believe the chief there was still a subsequent 
vote of the City Council, the Chief appeared at a FinCon meeting. The following week was the <coughs> final vote of the Council. Mm -hmm. So I thought the Chief thought it was prudent to wait until the following week for the Council to make a final approval of the funding. And at some point after that, there was a set of events that uh, changed the direction that uh, he was going with code enforcement, but literally within just a, within a few weeks, uh, Chief Crowley was coming in uh, as the new chief, and I think that uh, it would be fair to say that the transition had already begun prior to Chief Crowley being sworn in. So I think that uh, when Chief Hayden's initial plan that he stated here in front of the committee, uh, the council, uh, did not come to fruition. We were into a transition, and, and I think that uh, Chief Hayden at that point decided that he would allow Chief Crowley to address it. Okay. And did he, were you like a clearinghouse for the decision that he made or no? I was uh, made aware of it. I was not directly involved. I think, as I said to Council Sullivan throughout, what I have reiterated to both chiefs <coughs> is my commitment to the city having an even larger commitment to code enforcement, how important it is to the quality of life in the city, how important it is to stabilizing neighborhoods. And there are a lot of pieces to code enforcement. Uh, it's not, if anything, of the, the four primary agencies that are involved in code enforcement, I would say the police department's role is the least of the four agencies that are involved. Uh, Board of Health and, uh, and the building department are by far a greater percentage of, of uh, code enforcement responsibilities in terms of specific city codes and ordinances that they're responsible to enforce. But certainly there is a role for the police department in there. And uh, I think that uh, Chief Crowley has implemented a plan uh, that he believes will be even more effective than what we've done in the past. Okay. And um, off the top of your head, do you know if the other two departments are fully staffed? You said the uh, Board of Health and... Right now on the Board of Health, uh, I think our staffing is level with where it was the past year or two. And uh, I believe that's the same with the Board of Health. I mean, with the uh, Building Department and Fire Department, I think, also. So I'd say we have at least as many people in all of those departments working actively on code enforcement. And on any given, let's say, somebody calls about you know, a violation or something, or they suspect something's going on, how many people would respond, or, or how would that go? What, what, what would that so response the, be? So the, um, the complaint would be directed to the appropriate city department that's responsible for enforcing that particular ordinance. Uh, so as an example, if it's a complaint against a landlord, that's going to be Board of Health. If it's a complaint about an illegal apartment, that's going to be the building department. If it's a complaint about people working without a permit, that's going to be the building department. If it's concerns about a fire safety issue, the fire department will be involved. What about a license and a business operating without a yeah. license? So licensing is not exactly the same thing as code enforcement. And under licensing, Chief, how many do you have, about a dozen? <laughs> under licensing, the police department has 13 detectives assigned to as licensed agents uh, on a monthly basis. So they, each of them is doing it as additional duty, you know, part time, but there are 13 different detectives that in the course of their work during the month work on licensing enforcement. And that can be everything from uh, car, is it the repair shops or the car dealers? Car dealers. Mm -hmm. So from the car dealers to any other situation that they may be... Uh, serving liquor without a license? I would say that establishments serving liquor are always at the top of their activity list. Um, I think they also respond to complaints on a regular basis, and they also do a certain amount of proactive uh, checking on establishments. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. you. Councilor DiNapoli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mayor. How are you? Good evening, Councilor. Uh, can you recall the mayor's task force? Which one? The mayor's task force. Who, in your on, opinion, on code enforcement? On code enforcement, who was involved in the mayor's task force? What what parties were involved? 
Because when I traveled with them, I'll, if you don't know, I'll tell you. All right, so you're talking about in previous administrations, a Previ code enforcement yes, not task a, not, force? Not, not particularly under yours. But okay. Code, if, 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 if we call the mayor's task force for a certain item, the mayor's task force, quote unquote, would go out in, in service what we had a complaint about. And it included the building department, one officer from the Board of Health, a fire, de a fire department personnel, and a person <laughs> from the police department. And I, I believe that's what the code enforcement at the mayor's office was. Now that does not lo no longer exist, is that correct? I, so I am somewhat familiar with what you're describing. <laughs> I believe that that practice ended under the prior administration in terms of that group that you're discussing, Council, was a group of representatives of several agencies that I think they got together every other Wednesday or something That's like correct. that. It, end, it and ended with, in your administration, Bill. Excuse me? It ended in your administration. Oh, no, that's not Bell's, true. Bell's already had it under hers. No, no. Uh, th they were no longer working on that basis while I was still doing code enforcement. They, they were not working on that basis anymore when I was an outside code enforcement for the Board of Health. Now, I think, Councillor, and we may be splitting hairs informally, not, hey, we're all going to get together Wednesday morning and go to these five places. Uh, informally, I think it has continued all along. Typically what happens, and I, I think the, the model is that when someone from any of these agencies goes out on a complaint, they are always looking <coughs> for other potential violations that may not come under their jurisdiction. When I was out doing outside, outside code enforcement for the Board of Health, I might be out there on a trash complaint or a junk car complaint. If I, no <clears throat> if I noticed something that I thought probably was some type of violation but it wasn't under my jurisdiction, I immediately you know, referred that to code enforcement people from that particular department. It was not unusual for me to get called out by any of those other agencies because they're out on something and they say, hey, I think we got some outside violations here too. We you come out and take a look at it. So I think we're looking to strengthen those interagency cooperations. We're doing some things uh, with technology that for the first time is allowing some <coughs> of these departments to look at each other's records uh, as an example of being able to see permits in the Board of Health, uh, to see a vacant property list at the Board of Health that in the past other departments couldn't look in to see uh, that department's data to help identify these. So if we're talking about, you know, we're gonna line up six people every Wednesday and all drive around together. No, it hasn't been done formally in that manner for a while. However, uh, are we fostering interagency cooperation to make code enforcement more effective? Absolutely, and I'll, I'll give you a, a quick example. So we've, as, as part of the Mayor's Task Force on Housing and Neighborhood Stabilization, <laughs> uh, we have brought together a code enforcement working group specifically targeting vacant and abandoned properties. And we have, you know, building and fire and board of health and the BRA and I think one or two other agencies all with representatives at the table and they are all working together very closely to share information with each other so that when they're identifying a vacant property, we make sure that automatically the building department has an inspector go by, check for building violations. Board of Health has an inspector go by, check for um, building violations and also verify that it's been properly registered under the vacant abandoned property ordinance. So I think there's, I think we're trying to increase the synergy and the cooperation amongst the departments, but not necessarily in exactly the same structure you, do, you, uh, you recall. Okay. All right, I'm going to ask you a question. And let's see if you can answer this. It's a, a no-brainer, man. When you drive around the city and you look at all these used car lots and look at all these garages that we have, and I'm talking, they're everywhere. They're in my ward. They're in Ward 7. They're on the west side. Do you believe that every single one of them is in compliance with their license? On any given day? On any given day. Yeah, I, I, would, I would guess that with as the large number of them that you just described, on any given day, there may be some that are not complying. I think, and I'm, I'd like to ask Chief Crowley, because Chief, you have a report, could you? 
subsequent, if you recall, a couple of meetings ago, Chief Stadensky, the meeting I was not at, Chief Stadensky passed a list of complaints on. Yes, he to, did. He had a list Chief of complaints Crowley. for the chief. And those were based around, I believe, auto dealers and auto repair shops. So I would, uh, Chief Crowley actually has a report to share with that on, with you on <coughs> that. I think would be far more accurate than my speculation. Well, thank right? you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. And congratulations. <clears throat> I know I personally graduated months ago, but it's always nice to see you, and you're doing a fine job. Uh, trying. Uh, you, you know, you got to get your feet wet, that's for sure. <laughs> yes. So uh, how do we make out with uh, Councilor Sedinsky's uh, list that he, he gave you a list of about, what, 10 or 15 different garages? Um, I would say in the 30, 30 range. Oh, 30 garages. It's a three-page list. Um, <clears throat> they were primarily the major complaints were the condition of the property and working outside their licenses. Um, the report back to me was that uh, nothing but cooperation from the business owners. They were all visited once. Their licenses <coughs> were checked um, to see what stipulations are on the license. Then each thing that they were in violation of, they were shown. Mm -hmm. uh, they were asked to solve the problem. In almost all instances, they did. Um, the ones that weren't were given time to fix it. It's going to be readdressed within... Uh, Apparently, the licenses expire from the clerk's office on the 30th, um, and it will be addressed May 1st, and citations will be issued. I work with the, the law department to narrow down all the fines and where we stand, um, so we're good to go on that. Um, the one concern that he did report back to me was uh, on five separate places when they <coughs> had the license, there were no stipulations on the license. Um, it poses a problem to enforce anything if the stipulations aren't on the license. Um, so that's something to look at in the future to change things. Um, but overall, it, it's working out. Well, that, that's great. On the stipulations on the licenses, a lot of the garages have been in business for a long time. Years ago, we didn't put stipulations on their right. license, but all of us do. And you know, personally, Chief, I don't know how the other counselors feel, but if your guys go into a garage, if they go into a garage in Ward 5, Ward 4, they, they're in violation of their license. I would like to know about it because I gave them the license. Absolutely. You know, I mean, if, if, they're, if they continue to, you know, violate the law, we should address it through the city council. You guys do your job, and then you turn it over to us. You know, we don't want to put anybody out of business, but, you know, do you remember 159 Main Street? Yes, sir. Okay, that was Maya. There was, uh, it was a garage. There was, a, I believe the old Studebaker garage was there many, many years ago across the street from the old Zayas store. And uh, they had 200 cars in there and two boats. And they were licensed for 24. I mean... We don't need Thatcher Street on Main Street. You know, I, I, you know, I mean, they're out there trying to make a buck. I know it's tough. In some of these garages, I talk to the mechanics, I talk to the body shop people, and they don't make the money that other body shops make in different states. They work on shop money here. So what they have to do is they expand. They take too much work in, and then they, they do what they have to do. But uh, are you using your uh, licensing agents that we... Uh, the uh, licensing commission does when you <clears throat> your uh, your agents would visit garages and uh, uh, some of the uh, 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 thrift stores and uh, the the, uh, the stores that sell uh, old old gold and things like that would would they be considered that they would visit places like that too your licensing agents and that's through the licensing agents address things issued licenses through the license commission through the licensing commission but we listen we we issue licenses here through the city council yes so do those would, would those offices respond to our needs also that's how we did this okay all right well, that's great well i'm glad we're on top of it and uh, if, it, if it's working it's working if it doesn't we'll have to address it down the down the road but uh, thank you very much chief and mayor thank you very much also mr chairman thank you thank you council council <clears throat> monahan Okay. 
<laughs> I'm all set. <laughs> you all set? Yeah, I'm okay. all set. Any other questions for the, yep. Just Mr. Chairman, one comment. So, and, yep. and to the chief and uh, the mayor, I'm just sort of reflecting on the conversation here today, and I actually value, I think, the direction that we're going in more so than where we were, um, because I think those positions <coughs> should be less personality driven, and I, I feel that in some circumstances, we were way more focused on the individuals holding the position than the work they should have been accomplishing. And so it feels to me that whatever you're, you're doing in terms of rotating the positions or integrating it into uh, the work that's already being done is probably more beneficial because we're focusing on the work and not the personalities. And, and so uh, if, it feels to me like we're going in the right direction and, and if the results are the same, if not better, <coughs> then I certainly believe we are probably in a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can I make a favor of recommendation? Second. Second. Full council. Motion's been made and seconded to send back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? Goes back to the full city council. Favorable recommendation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Chief, and thank you, Mayor. We're going back to the agenda. I believe we're uh, on number. We should be number 15. 13. 13. Oh, 13. Excuse me. <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> Order that the city council attorney is directed to explore and implement any and all legal strategies and filings to maintain and uphold the city charter and city ordinances as they relate to the affluent contract that the mayor signed with the council order or approval invited Mark Gilday Legislative Council. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Dubois. I would like to postpone this. Um, are there two finance committee meetings yes, in May second, or one? Second, There'll be two. The second FinCom in May. Good. Second. <laughs> Motion's been made and seconded that this item be postponed to the second FinCom meeting in May. All in favor? Opposed? That's been postponed to the second meeting in, uh, in May. Thank you. We go Thanks. to item number 15. 16. Resolved that 15. a representative of Stonehill College be invited to appear before a committee of this council to review the relationship between the city and the college relative to provision of city services. <coughs> invited <coughs> Bill Carpenter, Philip Nazarella, city solicitor, and or his designee, Lawrence Riley, DPW commissioner, Francis Dillon, VP for Advancement, Stonehill College, Reverend John Denning, CSC President Stonehill College. And councilors, this was postponed uh, one other time. It was a resolve that was brought to us by uh, the Ward 7 City Councilor. And at that particular time, the uh, two uh, uh, people there from Stonehill College asked us to postpone it to this evening, but I don't see where they have uh, shown and, and nor had they uh, indicated to us that they weren't going to be here. So I don't know what the pleasure is. Council, if you want. What, what, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Actually, since there, we don't have any representation from Stonehill College, maybe we could just get a, an update. I've already spoken to the mayor on a, uh, at a different time about this, but maybe just give everybody a little bit of an update. Um, this isn't what I hoped for. I really wanted answers from Stonehill <coughs> College themselves, but um, Maybe we can just get an update of where the mayor is with them. Sure. Thank you, Good evening. So I have not had any recent direct conversations with Stonehill, so I cannot address why they're here or not here tonight. Um, in order to address the resolve uh, that you file council and provide an update, uh, you'll recall that last August, I sent a legal notice to Stonehill College notifying them that two years from that date, in 2016, uh, that the city would not be renewing the existing agreement uh, to accept their sewer effluent. Uh, we would not be extending, we would not be renewing. Uh, we sent that notice exactly two years prior to the date, the first day on which our legal counsel believes that we could get out of that agreement, uh, which is 20 years. I've been advised that there's a state law that stipulates that a municipality cannot be obligated in an open-ended contract beyond 20 years. And the most recent agreement was executed in 1996. So I did, after <coughs> several um, attempts to try to negotiate a resolution and not being able to get one that I was comfortable with, I did send that notice. I did provide the council with copies of that correspondence. And, uh, and I did indicate that if the opportunity arose, we certainly were not closing the door to additional uh, conversations or negotiations, but that it was important for us to give them sufficient notice because for something like sewer, um, to notify someone that you're gonna terminate a contract, if it, the court would ask us, the court would require us to give a reasonable length of time to the other party and our law office advised me that two <coughs> years would, 
would fit within the realm of a reasonable length of notice to no longer provide sewer services. So that was done. Um, very recently, a uh, couple weeks ago, uh, Stonehill College did contact us and, and ask if we would have a conversation. Uh, so we have had a couple recent conversations with them and I would say that uh, there was some change in their position and some progress was made, but nothing close to an agreement. Uh, but I'm still willing to try to pursue an agreement if we can get one that's in the best interests of the city. And certainly, uh, if we can achieve that agreement, we'll bring it to you. But right now, it's simply a reopening of, of discussions that we had over a course of time last year. Uh, but I think that uh, with some movement, and uh, with the possibility that maybe something will come together, but um, right now we're, wait we're waiting for a response from them. And perhaps uh, because in negotiations, you, you, both parties agree to keep the conversations confidential until they either succeed or fail. And that may have been a factor in their thinking to not appear tonight, but again, I have no idea. Thank I'm you. here, that's all I can control. Well, thank you for being here tonight. Um, my, so when, and I know you said you can't discuss what, you know, the negotiations, what's going on now, but are you negotiating past 2016 or are you negotiating the present time? Because that's what concerns me is the revenue that, we're lo that we've right. lost in the past and what we're still losing now. I and mean, we still have a little ways to go and um, I'm not sure if you can no, answer and that. that well, I can, I, I can answer that in general terms because absolutely that's why I was interested in negotiating with them a year ago uh, when there was still two years remaining on the existing agreement because if we were able to get a better deal that would supersede the current deal, then getting that in place two years earlier would save the city money, would generate additional revenue to the city. So I think that was um, part of our motivation in terms of being willing uh, to try to get a better deal instead of waiting for the end of this contract. Um, but in the discussions last year, it never got to the point that it was something I felt was something I could sign off on on behalf of the city. We're trying again. Now, do you have a figure for it? Do you know approximately how much we're losing in revenue for them not paying the correct <clears throat> rate? I would, and again, uh, Mr. Raleigh, the DPW commissioner is probably better equipped that, but. So I'll give you round numbers if I can without holding me exactly to the penny. <clears throat> right now, uh, Stonehill is paying the city for sewer about $270,000 <coughs> a year. And if all of their sewer, we know they've got like 51 or 52 meters over there. If, if we only had one meter that provided all of the sewer um, to Stonehill, uh, then the one meter rate would be about 420,000. So I think an easy answer to your question is, if, if the position is that there should be one meter for everything, a one meter would generate about $150,000 a year more. Now in terms of the rates, a lot of their use is residential and <coughs> I'm not gonna argue their side for them, uh, but their, their argument would be that a lot of the use is residential, uh, which, we do meet a residential building separately here. We don't lump them together. On the other hand, they're not in the city of Brockton. So I think everything is on the table in negotiations because they're outside the city. So um, I, I do feel that they should pay more and significantly more. And there should be additional benefits to the city that we're not getting right now. And that's why last year when we were unable to strike a deal that I thought was uh, fair and beneficial to the city of Brockton, I didn't make a deal and I sent them a, a legal notice that uh, our intention was to not renew or extend the contract in 2016. Very good. Quick question. Can I ask you who's who uh, is present with you during these negotiations? Uh, well, the most line? of the time I'm not. It's uh, our CFO, uh, Jay Condon, and Attorney Federoff that represent the city in discussions. And, and I'm sorry, and DPW Commissioner Rowley. Okay, because I had asked um, 
the DPW commissioner who wasn't really the DPW commissioner at the time, I had asked him the question. He said that it was being worked on, and this is, we're going on almost a year when I right. asked him the question. He said that it, well, the I, meter was being a year A year strong. ago at this time, we were in active discussions. It was last August when I sent him the notice. Oh, all right. Well, thank you for answering our questions, and I'm just hoping that we're doing everything we can to get to get August of to 2014 was the date, and I know I provided a copy of that correspondence to the council. Well, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Isaac. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. And my question, I think, and thank you, Mayor, for working on this, uh, is for Phil, if you could. In your opinion, and we've given the plenty of legal notice, so August of 2016 comes, and we can't come to an agreement with them. Is the judge going to really allow you, uh, us to turn that turn that off? Well, the, I'm sorry. What, I didn't Is the judge going to allow us, even with the two years' notice? What's your best best get? I think yes. what the mayor said was correct that the judge would look at this as an, an equitable situation, implying imploring the rules of equity. He would not just <coughs> shut them off with their, uh, a user of that proportion adjoining the city. He would extend what he believes is a reasonable time. He would probably bring the parties together in some form of mediation to find out what the pathways are that would lead them to explore a, hopefully a resolution. Or it would be clear there would be a lack of a resolution. But I would not foresee a judge when it comes to health, welfare, and safety of, of such nature and related to those issues, just shutting, um, shutting the user off. So <coughs> it behooves them to just drag their feet? No, it doesn't behoove them to drag their feet. I mean, both sides would be litigating it. And I, when I said not shut them off, I don't mean the next day. There would be a point down the road that they would. But if we have no and contract with them. I don't think an them. entity of that size would want to play Russian roulette as to when the judge would turn the lights off. So uh, they have. So uh, I guess that's my question. Is so you're saying that even though two years notice, you don't think is enough to to get that turned off? Well, if they refuse to come to an, some kind of equitable agreement, I think there has been negotiations that have been taking place. There has been um, uh, ideas on the table. So it hasn't been that w the notice has been given and there's been silence on the other side. So because it has been activity and interchange for this period of time, it would be clear to any judge sitting uh, on this case that it's a self, there's the salvation here and there should be pathways created between the parties to come to the table and find the resolution. So no, I don't foresee an immediate uh, termination by a court over this particular, uh, over the status so of So even this after the 20 years, you think a judge would still say that we can't say, you know, if you're not going to pay the rate, then you still are going to get sewage from us. No, he could say that. We're talking about the time frame that he would actually <coughs> take the action. And uh, because there's been some good faith on both sides, I don't think it would be an immediate termination. Okay. Thank you. I'll say Thank you, Mr. Council of Bonds. Okay. Um, understanding in, in the negotiation, actually, Mr. Mayor or Mr. Condon, oh, actually, Mr. Condon, since you were involved in the talks. <coughs> Understanding that uh, specifics about the negotiations shouldn't be discussed, to kind of bounce off, uh, off of what uh, Councillor Cruz said, are they biding their time to come up with an alternative? Is there an alternative for them or are we their only kind of game in town? Because it would make sense if they were kind of using this time to wait for the two-year deadline and then say, well, we don't need you anyway, and then go someplace else. Is that I, possible? I think their main alternative is either to come to a resolution with the city, which both parties accept, mm -hmm. or absent that, to build some kind of a mini treatment plant on site, and that would take some time. I don't think there's an alternative for them to go to another <coughs> municipality to get treatment. So it's really Brockton's treatment plant under an agreement or having a mini treatment plant constructed on their campus to handle their problem. That, that to me, would be the end, end game for them if they can't come to agreement with us. Okay, and in your negotiations, had you ever gotten an inkling that that might be something that they were looking to do, especially with all of their expansion? I mean, who knows what they're doing well, over there? Well, they'd rather not. 
that's why they're still in discussions with the city. But it is an option, so if it looks to them as if the extra cost that they'd have to pay to the city to get the treatment is more, and you know, they don't know what the future cost would be because it's on the rate block system. Mm -hmm. you know, so if we raise the rates 100%, then their cost would go up. So they might be in a position where they'd rather decide, let's have a treatment capacity on our campus, which we're under control, which have under our control. But I think, truthfully, what they'd like to do is to see a resolution which the city can accept and which is something they can live with too. Who's they, Stonehill or Stonehill. the court? Stonehill. Oh, okay. Stonehill. Okay, and um, is is the judge, you know, kind of? Judges, <laughs> no, well, the judges, there's no judge yet. I think no judge yet, okay. The city solicitor was talking about, should we reach an impact? 2016, okay. uh, 15 months from now, and not be in resolution of all of this, would a judge shut them off? I think that was the answer he was giving. Um, and he, he gave his answer to that. I will say, when, if, if we were to come to an end in this contract, mm -hmm. the $270,000 <coughs> of revenue that comes to the city would be gone. Mm -hmm. That's gone. Mm -hmm. There is not $270,000 worth of cost which would go away. I want you to understand that. The sewer business is essentially a fixed cost business. Mm -hmm. There's some variable cost, chemicals, treatment, but the staff that's working down there still going to be down there. It's like if you have a classroom of children and there are 16 kids in the, in the classroom and the classroom goes down to 14 kids, you don't fire the teacher. You just got two fewer teachers to teach, two fewer kids to teach. So you wouldn't get rid of $470,000 of cost. It would be a economic losing proposition to the city to lose that without replacing it in the treatment plan, to lose and, that capacity. Okay, and, and at their capacity and proposed expansion, do you think that Stonehill has the capacity to pay the rates? I'm sorry, would you ask that again? With what they have now, and let's just say they expand, they continue to expand and build, um, do you think that they have the ability to pay the rate? Which rate? This, uh, the, the regular pay the top rate? rate? Regular, yes. Well, they're not willing to pay the top rate. They're right right now, we have not come to an agreement where they would pay the top rate. But can they? Well, they can. that's up to them to say. I mean, it's, I, you know, it's a, what, would the mayor say $150,000? Whether they would be willing to pay that just for sewer, I don't know. I don't know. Right now, they're not willing to. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor DiNapoli. Thank you. Jay, you can stay there. No, did, no, I, no. did I hear you right? They're quibbling, quibbling over $150,000. Well, from their view, they're quibbling over almost a doubling of their bill. <laughs> yes. So they pay two, they pay 250 now, right? I think it's about so 270. It, it, may, it may go to a half a million, right? Uh, less than a half, yeah. Less than a half a million. With all their money, they're <laughs> they're, they're dipping us for 200 grand? Well, Councillor, from their view, I don't want, I'm like in the mayor, I don't want to argue the Stonehill no, position. That. But the Stonehill position is that they're under a contract which goes back in terms of its history to 1967. I, I understand. And which had as its basis a residential rate in the city of Brockton which would be applied to Stonehill. If you look at the contract, that's the history. Yeah. We have come to resolution of earlier billing disputes, which gave a nod to that residential rate, but never fully implemented it because yeah. we got instead the ability to charge the city's block rate. So now they're under a contract. We're saying we aren't willing to serve you under that contract terms any longer after its expiration. And we're taking the position, even though the contract itself doesn't have a termination date, that state law provides one, which is 20 years. And we've given them notice that should they not come to terms that are acceptable to the city, we'll refuse to serve them after 20, uh, 20 years have passed, 20, 2016. <coughs> city solicitor says we probably see some difficulty in doing that immediately, but sooner or later, if we don't come to an agreement, yeah. we'd be out of it. What I just said was, when that happens, if it happens, we'll see $270,000 worth of revenue at present cost walk away. We won't see $270,000 worth of cost walk away. To make the system whole again on an economic basis, we'd have to replace that revenue with some other user because we won't be able to get rid of those costs. So they aren't willing to pay that extra hundred and some odd thousand dollars because they don't think they have to. They're holding us hostage. Well, their, their view is we're holding <laughs> their, their view is we're holding them hostage, Councillor, yeah. because there is no other, no other, not one other outside user which is paying at that top rate block. Right. Not one. All of our outside users are paying on an average cost basis. So on that basis, yeah. they're paying many, many, many more times what is paid so by Abington or some other. So th they have their point of view as well. I think we can get to an agreement. 
I don't know if we're going to get the whole apple. I won't, don't want to prejudge it, and I certainly don't want to do it on television. Let's see what happens I, the I at the table. Get, get something better than nothing. But, you know, you know what the school is famous for. <laughs> we don't want to go to court over there. <laughs> Chances that we'll end up with a short end of the stick. You know, how many, I mean, did uh, Mr. Nizzarella graduate from uh, Stonehill College? I'm sure if a lot of the other attorneys have. What's that? No? Okay. What's that going to do with anything? <laughs> All right. All right, Jay. Thank you very much for your information. <laughs> Any other counselors before I go back to Councilor Azak? Councilor Rodriguez? Uh, no. uh, Mr. Mayor, if I could just ask you a quick question. Jesus. So, August 2016 shows up. What happens from a city standpoint? Well, I think that's <clears throat> what Attorney Nesrala just tried to answer, and he's better <laughs> prepared than I am. Um, no, I'm just, I'm just, the reason I'm asking is um, a resident of the city doesn't pay their water or sewer on a particular day. The city shows up and shuts it off. Right. So what I'm saying is that what happens, right. what happens to them on that particular day? Well, first of all, I think they would have not paid their bill. They've been paying their bill, but... No, no, I'm just right, saying no. the fact that you gave right, them... Right, it's a hypothetical. Let me just try to tell you what I... I'm not the attorney. We should have Phil answering this. I think we notify them we're shutting them off. I think they run into court and get a judge to issue a restraining order to prevent us from doing it. And I think that's <clears throat> the whole conversation Attorney Nesrallah was just having a few minutes ago that I think that uh, a court would become involved. I, I issued that notice to protect the city's interest. I'm not satisfied with the current deal the way it is. I don't think it's equitable to the rate users here in the city. I think it's hard for us to um, go back to you know families that are barely making ends meet and ask them to pay more money uh, when we've got a, uh, in my view, pretty affluent private school over in Easton um, that should be paying us more than they are. So. I mean, I don't disagree with anything any, any of the councils have had to say here tonight. And uh, from my position, uh, I've, I've issued the notice. Uh, but, I mean, it's, my goal would be to get an agreement that's fair to the city, that's in the best interests of the city. And we, we haven't reached that point yet. I'm not willing to take a bad deal. And that's why I haven't done it up to this point. Well, I, I hope that you don't because uh, based on some numbers that we had gotten from the DPW department, it seems that um, the VA hospital uses almost half of the sewage, or at least contributes half of the sewage that Stonehill does. And these are numbers that were provided to us, not necessarily numbers that we made up. And they're paying close to about $800,000 worth of sewage. And, and at the same time, oh, no, we have those numbers. I'm, I'm yeah, just saying that I, I hope that you continue the fight. Probably need Mr. Raleigh for that one, but. Uh, no, these are the numbers that are actually provided by Mr. Raleigh. I'm just saying that, you know, in black and white, if you look at the largest users of, Stonehill is by far the largest user, and yet compared to some of the largest the VA users. The council is the VA bill water and sewer or just no, the sewer only? No, he sent us just the okay. sewer, the sewer numbers. The VA, the housing authority, and some of these larger users, which, believe it or not, the numbers from, the, from Stonehill are by far higher, <laughs> yet they're paying a lot less in, in switch rates than those other places. Yeah, are. I think there may be an issue between a residential rate and a commercial rate, but again, we need Mr. Riley here. Be happy to review those figures. Have him come in and review those figures with the uh, with the council. Well, he submitted it to us, and that's why I'm, I'm I'm bringing that up in the fact that you know I can't imagine an institution such as Stonehill uh, to basically sit here and and quarrel over you know uh, a, a couple hundred thousand dollars. In fact, when some of the other folks who are, who are actually paying a lot more in sewage just for that privilege to actually uh, uh, hook up our sewer system. Yeah, I, I think part of the dispute is the one meter versus multiple meters. So if you have one large building like a hospital, it's going to be on one meter. They're going to pay the block rate. Where if you've got 15 or 20 different separate residential buildings, they would make the argument that we typically would have a separate meter on each building and we wouldn't be pooling buildings into one bill. I, th I think that's some of their position, but 
like the CFO, I don't want to argue the Stonehill side. I'm arguing the other side. I'm just trying to give you a little insight as to well, well that's the same thing the that we're doing. We're giving you some ammunition or some yeah. ideas and thoughts and stuff like that to make you make your point. The fact that you know we've seen some numbers, and those numbers don't equate, and it, it kind of validates your argument. The fact that we need to go after these individuals to say, look, you know, you had a 20-year contract, the contract expired, you need to negotiate this contract or else. I mean, it to me, it's not. I mean, what kind of a, what kind of a uh, of a message are we sending to, you know, the uh, the customers of the city, knowing right. that you know, no matter what happens, you got a contract, but nobody actually has to follow a contract except so and so and so. I mean, we were just talking about the uh, the police chief uh, following up on the on the thirty or so uh, violators of rules and regs, and yet you've got uh, other folks that feel that you know what, I've got a lifetime contract. And I don't have to be abide. I, I don't have to abide by anything. So that's why we're saying that, Mr. Mayor. Right. I, th I think that uh, again, I don't want to argue their case. They would make the argument that they are in compliance with the current agreement <coughs> with the city of Brockton. We're taking the position that we would like a new agreement. Nor do we intend to continue under the current terms once 2016 comes. <coughs> um, my preference is a favorable settlement over litigation, but unless we can get that type of deal, I'm, we're not going to make a deal unless I can bring it to the residents of the city and look them straight in the eye and tell them I think it's a fair deal for the city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Councillor Azak, quick, because we're going to take a... I'm going to be really quick, because I don't want... I know this meeting's gone on really long. Um, first of all, I don't agree with Mr. Condon saying we should take the their business just to have business instead of uh, losing the contract with them because it is it's bad business oh I'm sorry that's how it came across I don't and I I do apologize if that's not what you said but that's what I understood so um I feel like it's good business we need to get them it just in this day and age if we are running the city like a business we need to I mean I think it, it takes both sides and the original contract I <coughs> Stonehill has quadrupled, if not more, in size since the original contract. That's just common sense that they're going to, um, you know, that there may be contract changes. And I'm not there, you know, I'm not trying to do anybody's job in negotiating, but I think we just have to. Um, and they're I being, want they're to being charged for their usage. The issues revolve around the rate. Okay. Very good. If they use more, they pay more. The issue is what what's a fair rate, what's a fair Correct. way to calculate it. And you know, I, I think that uh, the current agreement is not a great one for the city. That's why I'd like a better one. I, I think Mr. Condon's point was, as I sit there and I'm advised by the DPW commissioner and the CFO and, and the solicitor, is that if that contract were to end, there would be a net loss of revenue to the, to the sewer department, which could actually cause a shifting of burden onto our ratepayers, and that's not what we're looking to accomplish either. So if we don't have another user lined up to take their place and spend just as much money, if not more, there actually could be pushing some expenses back onto our ratepayers. I, I think that was the point, that there's, um, there's some room for us to try to find a deal. Obviously, I'm... I'm not satisfied with the current arrangement. I wouldn't have sent him a termination notice. And uh, you know, my, my goal is to get a more favorable deal, uh, but we're not there. Well, thank you for your efforts. Thank you for being here tonight. I wish they had been, but um, thank you. Okay. Thank you. And what's your pleasure, counselors? We'll move to recommend favorably to the full city council. Motion's been made and seconded. That goes back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed goes back with a uh, favorable recommendation. Councils, we have to take a two-minute recess while they change the tape. Okay. Meeting's back in order. I believe we're item number... 16. Is it 16? They did. Oh. Item number 16, Madam Clerk. Resolved that the city solicitor be invited to appear before a committee of this council to review the issue of compliance with section 2-301 of the revised ordinances of the city of Brockton. Invited Philip Nazrella, city solicitor. Thank you, Mr. Attorney.
I believe, Council Dubois, I believe this was yours? Yes. Okay. So what have you reviewed, Mr. Attorney Nezzarella? In relation to what? This section 2-301, which I believe may be the wrong citation, but I believe it's about the ordinance that says that um, the city council has some authority over the real estate custodian, and then there was a letter from the Department of Revenue Correct. that said that it doesn't, but really city council ordinances stand unless they are challenged in court. So I'm just trying to understand well, no, what's going on there. Right. It doesn't say unless it's challenged in court. What it says that <laughs> under state statute, state law, chapter 60, section 77B, controls the process of um, communities selling tax foreclosed right. properties. And in that particular uh, state statute, it indicates that the city can, uh, or the mayor can appoint a, uh, a, an agent for that purpose, a real estate custodian who serves independently and can sell without permission of the, or confirmation by the city council. And if there is a conflict between a local ordinance in the state statute, the state statute will supersede and prevail. That scenario was also interpreted in 2008 at the request of the prior tax collector and um, treasurer. That was confirmed by the uh, DOR in, a, in an opinion letter issued by them. So, the, so that ordinance is still on the books, but because of what the state statute says, because there's a we conflict with the state it. statute, the state statute will supersede and prevail. Okay, so I just would like um, everyone to know that the next auction is what, on May 7th at 11 a.m. at City Council Chambers. Um, I say this because right now I'm dealing with people on Belgravia. There's a plot of land. All three of Butters wanted to buy that land and they, none of them were notified of the auction. And state law doesn't require a Butters to be notified. So there are plots being sold on Winter Street, Glendale, people in my district, go to my Facebook page, because I'm literally dealing with three people, all have good jobs, all have good salaries, all wanted to buy that property, all about that property, and they were all wanting to buy it, and now a developer bought it, and they're going to put up a house there. So I think everybody at home, I, I would really like it if the real estate custodian would make an agreement that he would notify the abutters to these properties. That is not happening right now, and state law does not require it. But people, I'm literally having a meeting with 13 residents on Saturday morning at 9 a.m. over this sale of this land. And I know that other people, if they're not having the same situation now, you will, especially if it's a small lot being sold in a neighborhood where people actually you know, make a good living and can actually buy the adjacent lot. So I'm having that problem. If you could please pass that along to Mr. Aubrey. And I, I will, and I time. can understand and respect your point of view, but in defense of the process, the notification is given to all residents, not a specific direct communication to uh, the abutters, but a notification is given to all residents, and the highest bidder, which perhaps was not the immediate abutter, prevailed and won the law. So the abutter was not at the auction because they were not notified of it, well, just to be clear. They and didn't. And the notification in the newspaper, the only reason I know about the May 7th auction is because a neighbor called me and said, did you know that there was going to be an auction on May 7th? I thought that Mr. Albanese had promised that he would be sending a list to us as a city council prior to auctions. I didn't know about the April one. I don't know about the May one beyond a resident calling me about it. And then the Belgravia folks that have to contend with this issue. I, I understand what the law says. And as a state representative, I plan on doing an amendment to this because it's fraught with problems. <coughs> At minimum, the abutters should be notified of the sale of land right next to their house. But that isn't what the law says. And I guess in this administration, we are just following the letter of the law and nothing more, even if it hurts residents. And I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Councilor. Any other questions? Or Chairman, on that, if I could. Councilor Sullivan. When uh, the real estate custodian came before this body, he did make it clear to us that he would notify us. And in previous auctions, each city council got a letter uh, that we could convey to our constituents. Uh, May 7th, that's the first I've heard of. I don't know if anybody, I know the president had uh, heard I, of it. And I recall that. I think it was on the question of Councilor Rodriguez that he yeah. said as a courtesy, 
Well, he, he, he also said put them in, in many languages as well, which right. I think is a brilliant idea. But did anybody on the council know anything about the seventh? No. Nope. Nope. Thank you. But I, I must say, uh, Council sure. President, I make no apologies for following the letter of the law. I don't know right. how much further above or below, but right. we right. do follow the letter of the law. Right, exactly. But if he did make that comment and indicated that he was going to notify councilors that there was going to be an auction, he needs, he needs to do that. He needs to stand by that. I think he even did that one night we were in a real estate meeting, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, that, that needs to be done. You know what I'm saying? Understood. Yeah. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the attorney? Council? Motion? Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Thank you very much. <laughs> been made, uh, motion's been made and seconded to send back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed goes back to the full uh, uh, recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Attorney. Thank you. That. We have item number uh, 17, Madam <coughs> Clerk. Resolved that the mayor, city solicitor, and the chief financial officer be invited to appear for this, before a committee of this council to review the legal and financial implications of the city's contract with Aquaria. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, no Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor, Moises Pariente, Aquaria Water, Rebecca McEnroe, Project Manager, Aquaria Water. Mr. Chairman, Councilor Sullivan. In light of the fact that Mr. Parente isn't here again and he notified us via email at 8.30 p.m. last night, I'm going to make a motion to postpone to the second, second. FinCom in May. Motion has been made and seconded. This will be heard at the second FinCom in May. All in favor? Opposed? That item has been postponed to the second <coughs> finance meeting in May. Item number 18, Madam Clerk. Resolved that the mayor and the city solicitor be invited to appear before the finance committee to discuss the existing contractual agreement with Aquaria and how to ensure communication from Aquaria to the city and the city council, given the difficulty the city council has encountered in having an Aquaria representative appear before the council. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer, Philip Mezzarella, City Solicitor. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to postpone this council. Second. Tonight, please, and he uh, wanted this postponed. Postpone on the second fit come in May. Second. Be made and seconded. This will also be postponed to the second FinCon in May. All in favor? Opposed? That will be heard on the second finance meeting in, uh, in May. Um, thank you, Mr. Condon. Councilors, just before we conclude, there was a list that was given to you tonight in regards to uh, some postponements that we've had uh, in past. I'm just going to I'm just going to let them stay as postponements unless a council wants to change at that point. I'm not going to go through it each week with the clerk. Oh, it'll just stay right there, and if it passes with legislative year. <coughs> That's fine. So we're just going to let that rest right there. Second of all, um, and if you didn't receive it in your mailbox, it is in your mailbox because on May the 11th, you're going to have your class photo taken, kids. <laughs> Seriously, your uh, picture, a council photo will be taken on May the 11th. I just want you to get that in your calendar so you know that 7 p.m. on May the 11th. Anything else? Council Sullivan. Mr. Chairman, two things. If I could, I want to recognize a belated birthday to award one constituent, nine-year-old Jack O'Donnell. Happy birthday, Jack. And then also, um, relative to the cable issue, I think collectively this body needs to uh, invite the appropriate people here. I don't know if it's Comcast, <laughs> I don't know if it's Mr. Lindy, uh, but I find it strange that in the last uh, two years, when I was president and now with Mr. Yanari as president, <coughs> we're having cable issues. Uh, ten years on the council, we had very few cable issues. We're having strange interruptions, uh, and, and it's really creating a problem. So. I'm going to make a, a, a resolve. I hope everybody signs on to it to have the people come before us. You know, maybe it's the construction they're doing outside. I don't know, but we need right. to find what it is because it's becoming a hindrance to the constituents that we serve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Council Azak. Um, I just want to remind everybody about Keep Rockton Beautiful, May 2nd. Um, but we do have a, me a planning meeting this Thursday, April 23rd at 6 o'clock in the evening at the East Branch Library. And I would also like to give a shout out to the Fuller Craft Museum. I attended an event this past Sunday there and it was packed and it was so beautiful to see the museum packed. And they put on a great uh, event. They had different speakers and I hope more people will visit the museum. We have a jewel in the city and I would like to wish my 14-year-old um, daughter a happy birthday. Hey. Very good, happy birthday. Good birthday. Anything else, counselors? Seeing as none, meeting's adjourned.